continue to do this and then actually play you know, balls inside, lower balls and come out in front, grab them, because that will make the, the defenders take a step back rather than a step forward. I don't know, but it, it didn't work. Yeah, I mean, sorry, that, I hadn't thought about that, that it was like, uh, you establish this, you establish this, you establish this, but actually the real thing you're trying to do is, is um, play them, make sure the defenders play from behind instead of in front. It could have been, because like, I mean, our, so as a defender, when you start seeing those balls, you kind of go, well, I'm not going to take that step in front, I'm actually going to play him from slightly behind, and then what you do is as soon as you see the man kind of nearly shaping up to kick it, you're already thinking about getting back to base, Right. Uh, and then all of a sudden he just makes a 20-yard forward run and he just gets a handy ball out in front, which they did start to find pockets of space but actually even the score like remember Gini's score he got Obioglik made a bit of a run he got fouled he went down and he flicked it across Gini hit it with his left foot oh, yeah. could have been a bit of a goal yeah, goal a chance yeah. um, that was just very a lot of patience they were just finding gaps in the Dublin defence and the, the, the Dublin defence did very very well like they were very tight unit I just, I just there was a couple of those like I mean if you're going to do that again then why don't you start Tommy Walsh I mean, look. Well, let's come back to the, these Tommy Walsh later on because there's yeah. loads of loads of points have been raised there that we should uh, dig into, and we will get into this in, in proper detail in a couple of minutes' time. Seven fifty a.m. this morning. Here's what's coming up: uh, sports pages reaction to the dubs around about eight o'clock. Um, going to continue talking about the All Ireland final all the way up until about half past eight this morning. Alan Quinlan's going to join us around about eight thirty-five. We're going to be joined by Paul Beelan at twenty past eight this morning to talk about the uh, nineteen ninety-five influence, obviously. Uh, a manager and two key members of the backroom team, all part of that 1995 team. Owen in Japan at 8.50, he'll still be awake. It's going to be the middle of the night for him. Oh no, it's, it's uh, early morning, isn't it? Because there was a press conference at 7am Japan time, so it'll be around midday. And uh, sports news around about 9.15. Uh, so we'll get to the papers now. The uh, star this morning have a wraparound record breakers, and the, uh, the S is the five that was in the... Um, in the crowd there, so there's some of the pictures that uh, Tommy was talking about, including the hospital ones yesterday, where they've uh, they brought the cup. Uh, a very relaxed day for them. Crying cockles and mussels, alive of five zero. We've got it. We're all going to be singing this, are we? <laughs> um, yeah. Amy McGee says the chasing pack are gaining on the dubs in his piece today, and I actually think that's true. I think that um, who does he put in the chasing pack? Well, I presume he's talking about everybody uh, from Kerry and. He says Kerry Mayo Donegal. and Donegal. Now, I'm not sure Mayo are, are getting closer, but look, what happens if Clux and Dos go? They're, they're a different team. Everything has changed. It definitely, it definitely takes a couple of points away from them and adds a couple of points to, to everyone else, absolutely. And I think part of that's confidence. Part of that's, oh, we're not going to get beaten over our heads by this guy. Even if Evan Covert is as good, He's not established yet. There's like a the, the mythology that builds up around teams. Well, does Cluxon get footballer of the year this year? I think so, doesn't he? I think he has to. Like big uh, moments again yesterday. You know, we talked about those big long balls in. Two of those he came and just yeah. And the confidence that like Davy Byrne at one stage has his, has his, is out in front with his hand. And he knows he's coming and he knows he's going to get it too. There's no there was no real sense of panic when they were going in because Cluxon is a bit, he's brave yeah you know, and he's big. And he's well able to come for those. And when he comes, he comes with confidence. And like, I mean, the save then, he cuts down the angle uh, of O'Brien. Like, he did everything he needed to do, the saves in the first game. There's a, there's a, <laughs> uh, is it Fenton who has the wide after the amazing kick out where um, Kerry's Mayor is on the is on the field, oh, yeah, yeah. marking um, Kilkenny, and he just spots that that's not actually a footballer and pings it straight to Kilkenny, but it's like a 70-yard ball yeah. straight into Kilkenny who lays it off and then there's a, there's a not a great wide, a bad wide. And you're like, you've just ruined like one of my highlight moments of the year. <laughs> like, that kick out now is completely useless. <laughs> no, he is. He's, he's, but if he does go, um, yeah, it leaves a massive hole. A really, really big hole for him. I've got the, uh, the Guardian here and... Uh, You've, you've, I, I like the way I've got all the uh, UK ones here. Which is <laughs> just, just an accident. <laughs> Tommy took those. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what a summer it's been. Root hailed series draw and says England will get better. That's uh, 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 Steve Smith there shaking hands. Looking extremely young. I couldn't believe how young Steve Smith looks there. Uh, shaking hands with Joe Ruth. Obviously after uh, England lost the Ashes. Oh, they won the Ashes. Oh. There you go. This is, uh, this is the sun here. Uh, Deja Blue, Dubs do it again, and that's um, Jackie's three in a row. Obviously, it was a, a double weekend for the Dubs. And then I have a deep love for these guys. Jack's got the bug. It's uh, Jack McCaffrey talking about how much he loves uh, his teammates. 
Um, the news coming from um, Japan is that Joe Schmidt will be staying in Ireland, that uh, he's not going to move back to New Zealand. Um, he confirmed that it was his mother who passed away uh, recently, and that was the funeral that um, he'd headed down to uh, New Zealand for, remember, before the Italy game, that um, he'd gone down to uh, New Zealand after a bereavement. So um, it looks like he's going to be staying in Ireland. And I'm just trying to find Alan Shearer's column here, but it's not. Is it? Is it in the Irish edition? I'm not sure if it is in the Irish edition. You, you tell us what you got there. Morning, yeah, I've Alan. got the Times. Uh, see you down under in 2021. England draw series. Uh, sorry, the Drew series, and obviously one of them on the, on the draw. This is an interesting one. Farrell's tackle style outlawed. So they're saying that Owen Farrell has been forced to make changes to his tackling technique to avoid being caught in a World Cup crackdown on dangerous play. Uh, the England captain escaped punishment for two shoulder charges where he failed to wrap his arms properly around the opponent last autumn. If you remember that, actually. Yeah. He absolutely nailed the two guys. One yeah. South African and one Australian fella. And he does kind of, he definitely comes and hits you with the shoulder rather than actually getting the hands across. So, yeah, so that's, uh, that's an interesting one for Farrell. I want to play a bit more of this. Here's some, some Brian Howard speaking yesterday. Have a look at this. I know we spoke to Jim yesterday after the game and he said he felt that overall the All-Ireland Finals, the atmosphere was never as good as it was yesterday. What was it like for you? Um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. I know, you know when I was a kid, that's, that's what I dreamt of and to be able to play two in two weeks, it's, I know some people are probably like at uh, the last one because it was a job, but, but I was more excited now because I knew what we had to do and I know, knew, we knew going into this game that, that we wanted to win, obviously, and what we had to do and to put the wrongs right from the last game, and, and thankfully we did that. What was the buzz like when the final whistle blew and you knew what you'd done? Um, I don't think, obviously the five in a row, it's huge and it's an amazing achievement, but, but at, once the whistle went, I think it was just a sense of relief for 2019's All-Ireland, because when we met back up um, in January, that, that was our main goal, to, to win, win it this year, and um, regardless of the five in a row, we knew the significance behind this year, but we knew going in that, that we just needed to, to do our job, and, and hopefully that was going to be enough, and thankfully it was. And lastly, you've said the words five in a row a couple of times there, they weren't words you guys used too much in the build-up, but when you're older, you might have kids, you might have grandkids, it's something you look back on and go, I was part of that team that made that five history. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, it's a huge honour to be involved, but we know, speaking on behalf of a lot of the younger lads, and and uh, even some of the other lads that, that aren't um, that are sticking around, that we, we don't want to stop here, we want to keep going, and, and we're hungrier than ever, because personally, this is my third, so I'd like to make my own five in a row, so so that's, that's what I'm going to hope. It's funny hearing um, Brian Howard say that he was really excited by the second game. Jack McCarthy in the papers today is saying he was just sickened by the whole notion of having to go back training, that he'd emptied out his locker at training before the first game. And the whole following week, he was like, on Tuesday, the whole notion of playing a game of football just wasn't into it. Missed training on Thursday because of work. And, oh, um, right. And um, just was like not into the whole notion of having to play a replay. Whereas Brian Howard's like, yeah, I was really excited, I got to play again. He was unbelievable. He's had a, he's had an unbelievable year. I, I thought he was fantastic yesterday, Howard. Definitely in the should be in the conversation for football of the year. The the drawn the performance in the drawn match was one of the best individual performances I've seen. Like obviously he didn't even get man of the match for that, but it was sensational. And um, but I think it is probably Cluxton at this point, is it? I think it is Cluxton, yeah. But when he had to make he had to make a few readjustments yesterday. Obviously, uh, when when McCaffrey went off, you know, McCarthy back in and him into midfield, and he took he, he essentially took more for a lot of it. And um, there's a ball at around 61, 62 minutes. I don't know if you remember. There's a kick out, and someone comes in and cleans him from the back, and the ball breaks, and there's three carry men. There's two carry men coming in, and there's a carry man, and he he dives on the yes, ground to get yes, it. Yes, yes. And I just went, I kind of went. Kerry aren't winning this game. That was sensational. It was unbelievable because he had no right to get it. And he got it and he was up like his athleticism because he, he grabs it and you think, okay, he's going to land on the ball and yeah, then yeah. they're going to come in and smother it. But he gets up and gets out and gets a pass away. It was just, it was just, I think, I think he's been absolutely fantastic. And, you know, he, he's, he, he plays a different role to Kilkenny where Kilkenny kind of swings the ball and moves around. He just, he, you know, the other step he has where he just comes back onto his right foot. They're all so aware of it now. It's kind of like the Kavanaugh step. <laughs> like everyone is kind of going, you can't get too close to him. So by virtue of that, he's able to get his head up and ping balls. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and still, there's, like, um, there's, there's more, definitely more to come from him oh, as he gets more and more absolutely. comfortable and they expand his role. Yeah. The Herald, the back and front there, six appeal and the famous five. One more year, they're asking the front uh, cover of the Herald this morning. So it's a full 
full football final special here. Uh, Blues hero Jim Coy on future is the sub-headline. Uh, Dublin manager Jim Gavin will take time to reflect on his future after leading his team to GAA history. So there was... Um, it would be interesting because I, I think Jason Sherlock has a, has a, has a, has a pretty new, uh, a big uh, appointment in DCU. Um, so again, that'll be interesting to see, will he, you know, because I think they're very much a team, um, you know, in what they do. Very, very interesting again yesterday. There was three or four massive things we can get into later of basketball things that they did, like, just really, really well. Four scores. That really worked. Right. Yeah, some brilliant, brilliant stuff. Like, you know the old... You remember people saying they're, they're using the referee? Yeah. I don't know if you remember the score, but I think it was either Mannion or, or Rock near the end where they're coming and he comes out on the loop around... Someone just pops in the pass and he goes around Connor Lane and the carry defender has to cut across in front of him and he just sticks it over the bar. And then there's another one where McCarty... The brilliant third man tackle. Yeah, it was just a lovely shield. Well, he just kind of stood there and just boop. Yeah, just just bumped him. The perfect mm. shield, as in yeah. basketball. Lane didn't pick it up. And he no, he just, just sticks it over the bar. And suddenly there's like ten yards. Sean, o yeah. Sean O'Shea is the one who's like, well, and they didn't give out about it. You're kind of thinking that's the type of thing. You're saying, ref, did you not see this linesman umpire? You know? Yeah, yeah. There was definitely like a, a little bit of inexperience around that. So, but you see, you can do it. Like I mean, you know, I can just oh, sorry, you know, I just I just happened to. But you can see McCarthy. McCarthy is watching it from behind, and he knows that the ball's going to come out. He's going to give it and just just uh, step in front. Front cover of the uh, Examiner, uh, a five alive O with history made. Will everyone else still be dancing to Dublin's tune in 2020? Kevin McManaman, I wonder will Kevin McManaman stick around? Yeah, he's probably in my five to be honest. Five who are going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, I think he's in there. I think you've got O'Gara, you've McManaman, you've 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 Bernard, you've Paddy Andrews. Um, that's four. You may have more. You know, potentially Cluxton. Yeah, and then. If Cluxton goes to loads more go, do they kind of decide, right, well, look, it's time for the next generation now, or...? Yeah, I'm not sure, like, of, the, of some of the other guys in the panel, like Darren Day, I'm not sure what age he, he would be, but there's a number of fellas that you would imagine who... It, 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 like, it is, it's a massive pull of experience away, as well, you know, away from the setup. Day's 32, Tommy's telling me there. Right. Uh, the Irish Times this morning, um, and they've got the picture of the... Um, balloon, the five balloon. On this clear day, Dublin can see forever is uh, the headline on Keith Duggan's piece. And then Ireland well set for cover if Henshaw's ruled out. So the news about Henshaw, I think, is not as negative as it was around uh, throw-in time in the game on Saturday evening. It was coming through from Japan that Henshaw had done his hamstring and um, all number of potential permutations, including Will Allison replacing him in the squad, were uh, being floated at that stage. So... Um, I think that's all the papers this morning. Have you got anything else for us? Oh, I've got the Telegraph. Um, you know, more talk obviously there about uh, root redemption of the England cricketers. Also, there's a little bit on uh, Europe. Uh, the miracle of Glen Eagles. Wildcard Peterson grabs the Solheim Cup uh, with final put heroics. It was meant to be unbelievable uh, drama uh, at the at the uh, in Glen Eagles. And you have a little bit obviously about Watford and what they did with uh, <laughs> to Arsenal. <laughs> Happy enough with that. Are you you're a Spurs fan? Yeah. Right, sorry, I missed that. Uh, That's all right. They, um, was it 2-0? Did they come back for 2-0? Or was it just yeah. shock and defending? They gave up two-goal lead, yeah. Uh, so, as we were saying, kind of half-time, all the Arsenal fans were like, yes, this is what we wanted. Yeah. It's the type of football we need. And then by the end of it, it was like, oh. I missed that. I was watching the uh, all in the final back again. Um, the, it's a very different experience watching the game on TV from being at the ground. Massively, yeah. I, I was I, I couldn't get there on Saturday, so I've watched it twice. But it is it is very different. You don't you just don't see all that. Like I mean, people are saying about Tommy Walsh and Philly. Of course, you don't catch that on the Maybe, TV. Yeah. You, you and then, then you're trying to put a camera on that. Like. Yeah, and I was trying my best to get the matchups. And even when you're watching it on TV, you're going, uh, it's hard to pick up the matchups, yeah. you know, because you can't see it in obviously in real time. Yeah, because the, the defenses that, are setting up. And it's ultimately it's very zonal in loads of different ways. So uh, at the first game, people were saying, oh, you know, Jack Barry it was like a shadow to uh, fans. Like, no, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. Like, no, not he wasn't at all. No. Exactly. Yeah. But I was reading the papers going, uh, I don't know, it was just bits and pieces of that and seeing on Twitter especially, it was like, oh, um, Fenton was better in this game but he wasn't at his full... No, no, he wasn't imperious as usual. Who, w w was Crowley playing six for Kerry? Because sometimes on the TV it looked like he actually was kind of playing left half back. Yeah, I don't know. And then drifting in. Because I, the middle, the middle again, 
got them. They seem to be tracking Kilkenny. Yeah, if you watch the middle, most of the most of the good scores Dublin got, and the big scores were just simple balls down the middle where they where they pulled guys out of the middle, and then they just pop balls in in front. And either it was Con or someone else in there, he just turned bang over the bar. Do you just need a midfielder whose job it is to be an extra body in the middle? Is that like I think so. You're either doing that or you're telling Crowley or whoever, don't don't worry about going out left and right. Yeah. Leave them out there. Because I think they were caught in between a little bit of man mark and where they were being pulled. But then ultimately Dublin, like there was a lot of, if you remember, there was a, there was a number of easy scores where they just put it into that area. And it wasn't, and it was one on one in that area. Yeah. Um, and it was Khan, I think, a couple of times he just turned and just uh, just just stuck it over. Actually, the one which he, he probably should, could have got a goal on, he blasted it over. Um, even Scully's one, do you remember? For the, for yes, the shot? Yeah. Like, I mean, Scully finds himself in acres of space in the middle that time. That was just after the goal. No, yeah. was Scully's yeah. just after, after the goal. After, 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 after all Brian's chance. Right. Basically, it came down the field. They should have had a goal too. Dublin had a shot. Yeah, that would have been the ball game right there. Yeah. But it ended up not mattering that much. We're going to take a quick break. And we're going to get back to you about uh, how the All Ireland final was won and lost. You can give us your comments, hashtag OTBAM on Twitter. You can leave a comment on whatever stream you're watching us this morning. It's five minutes past eight. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Sport Ireland Campus Blanchardstown is the home of Irish sport, not just for our athletes, but for you in the community. Check out our amazing offers for families with kids' camps, sport academies and birthday parties. Or for adults, why not join our gym with a 50-metre pool? Or your club, school, friends can book one of our world-class indoor or outdoor facilities, including our athletics track, soccer, basketball or badminton courts and many more. Check us out on Sport Ireland Campus. Join Bruce Betting now for a risk-free first bet up to €100. Euro. That's right, new Irish accounts can enjoy a risk-free first bet up to €100. Euro. So if your first bet loses, we'll refund your stake with a free bet. Now that's giving you more. Bruce Betting, in store, online and now on your phone. T's and C's apply. Please gamble responsibly. See dunlouis.net. OTB AM So with Dublin's Philly McMahon Philly all Ireland champions again how have the celebrations been over the last 12, 14, 16 hours? Uh, it kind of feels similar to the last couple of years but um, it's, it's obviously nice having it on a Saturday winning, winning the all Ireland on a Saturday and having a Sunday getting down to see the kids uh, in the hospitals is, is, is really important to us and um, you know, giving, it, giving them a bit of happiness and the smile on their face is very important. Your own role in the match yesterday, a bit different to previous years when maybe you would have started. How did you find that? I know you said after the game yesterday that you wished that the game went on longer because so you could have played longer. Definitely, yeah. Like I, I, I was, um, I missed the Mayo game and I missed the the Kerry the, the first game. Um, so, you know, going in at that time in the game where it was in the melting pot is quite tough. Um, and marking a guy like uh, Walsh, who's, who's played a little bit. So, yeah, no, it was intense. It was, uh, it was exactly the way you want it. And, and as I said, I'd love to play like, a little bit longer, but we got over the line at the end. Is the winning feeling at the end any different to each final that you've won in the last five, six years? Uh, yeah, definitely. As you get older in your career, definitely it is. You know, you, you, you don't know when the last one's going to be. So uh, it gets, it's not that it's four or five in a row, whatever it is. It's just that you... You, you know, you, you, you've won an All Ireland and you've got over the line. Philly, congrats, well done. Thanks, Amy. It's uh, Philly McMahon speaking with Jamie Moore yesterday. Um, uh, just on that, a uh, Saturday All Ireland, like, can we not just get somebody? T- you can put a motion to Congress now, surely. Come on, yeah. stick, stick, stick it in a motion in there. <laughs> uh, Saturday All Ireland, and we can be three o'clock throw-ins, who cares? Like, the Sunday game was a Sunday game because farmers wouldn't be able to take the day off working, right, back in the day. I mean, yeah. like, and plenty of people worked on Saturday. Yeah, and yeah. it turns out loads of people still work on Saturdays, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, but, I mean, come on. Get it was brilliant done. having an extra day. Yeah, no, it is. It is. I think the players will say, absolutely. The players will be all over it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was. I have to, like, you were just saying there about the different uh, feel. Looking at the pictures, it just looked absolutely. Like, I mean, what a beautiful day. It was sensational, like, it, was, yeah. it was absolutely perfect for football. It was September as well. Yeah. It's like... All in the final in September, around the oh, 16th. It just, but it's like, what it, it's supposed to be. Let, let's look. Like, I mean, you're, you're going to get into the nitty gritty of it, but some of the scoring, some of the movement, the hits. Like I mean, they were the intensity of the play. Like I mean, the two, the conditioning of both teams is absolutely phenomenal. 
you know, like, I mean, even the merchant's gold, you could see him coming out and he's blowing it. Like, I mean, the excitement. And I watched him, you wouldn't have seen this, but in, in uh, you know, in the national anthem before, the camera pans to him and he's the eyes closed and he's taking some really big deep breaths. That was a big day for a ah, young yeah. lad like that. He is, yeah, you, know? you forget. I thought he was, he was very, very good. He, he was, was great. Really good. Yeah. He's, um, he's not, he's not a, an archetypal defender, so he got taken on a couple of times. Mm. And um, I, I think the gainy point you were talking about earlier on comes from somebody just beating him. Yeah. Maybe yeah. maybe it was a, a ugly. And, uh, and okay, but he's not in the team to do that. He's in the team to do lo loads of different yeah, things. And yeah, for yeah. the pace. Yes. For the recovery pace. Yeah. And for picking up those. Like he was go to for quite a lot of um, kickouts, or certainly the next pass off the short yes, kickout loads of times. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he had an excellent game. I didn't. Who did? Who did I don't know who got man of the match officially. What, I don't know. I think people were talking. Kilkenny, Kilkenny got the RT yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kilkenny. You can't. You can't argue with that too much. Yeah. I thought he was good. You know, he made an unbelievable block. Um, I think the, the, the block was the Hollywood. That was, the, was the Hollywood block. Was the kind of like like cherry on top. Man of the match. Thanks very much. Yeah. Obiuglik was following him. I, I'm, I'm like of all the Kerry defenders, I think Obiuglik is probably one of the weakest. Right. So um, I'm not saying he had an easy day. Yeah. Right. But I think of of all of the guys, you should say, okay, this is a fella I'm happy enough to probably take on. I think I think so. He probably showed up a little bit better than say say Manu did or, or, or even Callahan did but I thought Callahan and, and had, a, had an unbelievable game there was a threat every time he got the ball I, so know, he, and he's marking their best their def best defenders marking him yeah and I think look, he, he had that same threat in the first game certainly you could you could feel at the game that every time he got the ball he was on the verge of doing something yeah. it just didn't break for him and the three early points certainly gave everybody okay right let's all just make sure that this isn't going to happen again to us yeah, so. yeah, yeah. you were saying earlier on that you thought Kerry were going to have Significant regrets and about the the basic errors yeah. in strategy, tactics, matchups. If we were to to rank the the errors and the stuff that's going to give them the sleepless nights, what's it going to be? Um, maybe selection first of all. You know, I think I think where they've been a bit too cute. Like I, I, you know, we were talking last week of you know whether you would start Tommy Walsh and. I think if you're going to the 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 premise of starting him is based around obviously what style of play you're going to going to adopt for the game. And if you're going to adopt for the first ten minutes, we're going to put in long ball, high ball into a two man full forward line. Well, then you're going to say, well, I tell you who I want in there. Mm. I want a guy in there who Dublin are going to be worried about because he is physically a presence in there. You can mean, and you can then have even three in there. You can have Geeney and Clifford around him. Yeah. But if we're going to, I, I always felt Kerry needed to be, they, 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 they couldn't be chasing that game for the first 10, 15, 20 minutes. They, they, it was going to be too much of a mountain to climb after the last day. They needed to actually get out of the traps early and put Dublin under pressure and really start with Dublin to ask the questions. Once Dublin got the goal and once they got it, they, they looked pretty much in control to me. They were able to always tag on a score. Um, and even though Kerry got back to the 10-all, the there were some magnificent scores in that. The, you always felt a little bit that they were, they were striving, they were putting a bit more effort into it to get to that level rather than Dublin were. You know, that, that was the sense I got. So I think he, above all, would have... I, didn't, I don't think the O'Connor thing really worked out for them. You know, I, 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 I pretty much speculated with you that I thought Gavin White wouldn't start. He mm. didn't. I don't know if he really added a whole pile when he came in. Um, you know, if you're looking for legs, that's all fine. You know, but I think I think the impact players needed to be on the field. You're looking for those guys who are really going to make an impact from the start. Then, if you want to bring legs on at 45, 50 minutes, you're two or three points ahead. Yeah. Bring the legs on and say, right, you pick up him, you pick up him. Just run with him. Make sure you knock. You know, make sure he doesn't do anything spectacular. Keep with him, and we kind of. What we have, we hold, and we counterattack. Then we soak up a bit of pressure and counterattack because we still have two of the most dangerous forwards in the country, and Geeney and Clifford were living off scraps for a lot of that second half. But played well, like and we're, and we're playing well. Um, yeah. I th Geeney really a great game, savage game, and, uh, and yeah, I, I think he was man of the match for Kerry. And I think I'm delighted for him because he didn't get any credit after the miss and the penalty miss the mm. last day, even though he, he did play quite well. But um, just on the point about starting Tommy Walsh, Dublin have to react to that somehow. And now maybe maybe they always had it in their head that Philly McMahon was going to mark him. But who knows? If you start Tommy Walsh like 15 minutes before throw in or whatever time you have to announce your team, mm. do Dublin then have to make that change before as well? Are they potentially like? And so suddenly they're thinking twice, going, "That's not actually what we wanted to do." Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of it's it's already you know to a certain degree they're dancing to your tune. 
you know, so it's, it's already a little bit of a psychological win for you. Um, I thought he did really well when he came in. He won every ball. He won every ball. He won it out in front. Yeah. He did what he needed to do. And, and you see, he, he gives you that as well, Jerry. Well, we were talking about that first 10 minutes of you put in ball after ball. I think it was five or at least five or six balls that went in long, right? So as I say, the defender takes a step back. Now, if you've Tommy Walsh in there and one or two, then you just give him the ball out in front and he wins it out in front and he has runners. Yeah. You know, and it's a bit more open. There's a bit more pace on the run. There's a bit more kind of, you know, fellas being all over the place. I, I certainly would. I, I, I think he, he, he should have started. Um, and, you know, honestly, I think probably whatever way you can engineer it, I thought, I thought they needed to have all of their firepower on. Whether you don't start Spillane or not, it would have been between him or Tommy. I think you needed to just a bit more firepower up front. You definitely needed more firepower up front. Um, I think then they, 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 they're, they're central, they're core, they're, they're six. I thought, I thought they just got pulled out of there way too much. So I think they should have said, right, what we're going to do is we're going to deploy someone back there, whether that was Spillane or Jack Barry, but they needed someone just to sit in that hole in in front of O'Callaghan. Because O'Callaghan, essentially, if you watch, he loves to get the ball really at the top of the D. And then he just turns at you in an instant and he's going right down yeah. the gun at you. Mannion likes to get it more out to the side where he'll be able to step and he's turned onto his left foot and then he can swing it over with his left foot. He loves to get that ball where he's coming down the right side, steps inside you. Whereas O'Callaghan is, give it into me here, high, low, dirty, it doesn't make a difference, and I'll go right at you. Now, you need a man there who has the ability to double up as soon as he gets that. You may not stop the pass, but you can certainly get there and help your cornerback or your fullback, and they didn't have that, really. Yeah, and that wasn't new news to them either. Was it because that, was it because Cal- Callan didn't perform on the scoreboards that they thought that wasn't going to happen again, so therefore, look, that's grand, we have those matchups right from the first day? Maybe, they felt, maybe there was a little bit of that. There was a little bit of that. I think I think Dublin learned. Like I thought, you know, I heard Owen and yourself were chatting about deploying Keane O'Sullivan and stuff like that. But Dublin, I was saying, no, O'Sullivan potentially with his injuries and stuff like that, I didn't think it would happen. But they learned from the first day in the sense of they went, okay, you know what? We're not even going to be brave about this and try and think we we're actually going to we're going to we're going to concede the fact that they have some serious forwards and we're just going to put an extra man in there. And it worked. Yeah. In that first 10 minutes, it worked perfectly. It was like, Perfect. as you said, they, they were overloading and they always at least had one <clears throat> and sometimes two men extra free. Why would well, people miss on that as well, though, is, and this is what Dublin do so well, when they won those four, four five or six balls, watch the exit, yeah. how quick the exit comes. Because they actually have guys, Davy Byrne just took off, McCaffrey took off a few times, and all of a sudden they're coming running at you in threes and fours and you're going, who do we pick up? Yeah. So it's not like you've tagged a guy and he goes in a run and you're able to stop his run. It's now fellas coming at full speed, changing angles, much more difficult to stop. The, the kickouts, if you were to go back and just kind of watch the two videos side by side from the two games, they were completely different. There was almost no contested balls around midfield from, from both sides and uh, neither side put up a high press for the majority of the game. Well, bo- well, both sides won every single one of their kickouts in the first half. I thought, like that, that hasn't, I don't think that has happened in a game all championship. Uh, why was that? Why were they just deciding, okay, you were well, going to... Well, first of all, you, you, you obviously had Dublin, who, who had decided to drop back a man, right, slightly. So he was a bit more removed. But I think they just said, you know what, let's have them there. We have a man back here, we look after Because you can't, it's very difficult to play that high press and also have a man back. Okay. You're, you're really One causing yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can't. Because what happens with the high press is if they get out over it, you're completely exposed. Yeah. So they said, we don't want to be that. So we'll actually just give them the kick out here and, we, and we'll take it on from, you know, 45, 50 metres out from their own goal and we'll just we'll slow it down and that's essentially what they did. Now they still made it difficult enough but to be fair Ryan had a very good game in goals for Kerry. Yeah. Like, I mean he's a guy who's probably you know new on the scene. I thought, he, I thought he was really really good. I thought he was very very good with his kickouts. You know there was a couple of times there where he just got them out into areas down the middle especially to Paul Murphy you know where there was a lot of bodies around and he just got a little perfect little chipped kick out um, but no, I think I think I think both teams said, "Well, we've shown our hand on that, so we'll revert back and we'll just try something different." Yeah, um, I think Spillane as well was meant to. If you watch Spillane, Spillane was meant to, I think, be back in that middle role. A lot of the scores where you see where that 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 middle has been exposed, he's kind of chasing back. He wasn't there exactly, you know. And I'd say when they looked back at it, they went, mm, 
maybe he wasn't the man for that because it's quite a different role for him. I don't yeah. think that's, that's, that's not his, his thing. I, I thought as well um, Paul Murphy's injury was something that mm. Kerry couldn't afford whereas Dublin could just about afford Jack McCaffrey's. Like, they, you know, Howard ends up going back and um, they, they're able to absorb it in a way that it's not critical but Kerry didn't have anybody to drive forward at that point in the game when they needed him. But I watched it again last night. I think they took eight minutes, seven, eight minutes to get him off. You know, and I'm kind of going, that's seven, eight minutes of a critical period. And you remember, a ball comes down and he was kind of acting as a spare man for a while because he had, I was trying to watch where where he was involved and he doesn't get on the ball at all in that period, yeah. right? He doesn't present himself at all. And then a ball comes down, a kind of a, a, a scuttery ball comes down the middle and he goes across and he pulls on it. If you remember, he slides, he kind of pulls on it, and then he goes down on the leg. So that was obviously the final part of the, the, yeah. the hamstring. But he had definitely done it, because you can see him on the ground on the TV, and he's saying to whoever comes over, there's something wrong. So I'm kind of going, get him off straight away. And they actually make two other substitutions before they substitute him. Right. They substitute, uh, they bring on Gavin White, and they bring on Sherlock. So now you've, you've taken off two other guys, and now you have to take off him. You know, and you're kind of going, okay, now you've, you know, even from a substitute type, of, you know, you're sitting there and you're going, I have my guys who I need to come in. You probably would have brought Sherlock in for him, you know, and then kept, who did Sherlock come in for? I think Sherlock may have come in from Robioglick. Right. But you would have said, because now you've essentially used three backs, you know, when really you didn't want to. You yeah. could have only used two. Yeah, and... and uh, 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 it's a small thing, but it matters. Well, it's, uh, at that stage, they're, they're, it feels like they could get that back they could still get into the game and they mm. don't get into the game and it's those little it's an accumulation of all those decisions really as opposed yeah. to one individual yeah. thing yeah. right we want to move on and talk about the influence that the uh, the 1995 team have had on the five in a row uh, there's been a, a number of pictures over the last few days um, posted Declan Lally posted one on Twitter from 1997 of um, J.O. Jim and uh, that's uh, Paul Clark on the left hand side there and then of course they were um, their pictures were doing the rounds Again, the three of them. Um, and so there's Jason Sherlock in the middle. I think that's the Cork jersey, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. A bloodstained and a bloodied mouth on um, Jim Gavin's It's the Tyrone jersey, sorry. And uh, and then beside them is Paul Beelan, who joins us now. Paul, good morning to you. How are you doing? Good morning. Good, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the 1995 crew, did you know that you had such um, an incredible brains trust on the field of play with you when you went out to battle every day? Yeah, well, it's it's it, it's fantastic. I mean, those those guys you mentioned in '95 were a special group. Um, you know, Jim, Jason, and Paul Clark and Mick Deegan also, who was part of that squad, uh, have gone on to fantastic things. Um, did I know? Uh, I, I probably didn't, but looking back on it, I, I, I'm not surprised. Um, you know, uh, even Pat Kilroy, who started the 2011 success uh, of this of this current team, um, was part of that team also. So. They, they, they were a special bunch of, of players back then. We were, we didn't win. We won one on Ireland. We were beaten in, beaten in two, uh, won two national leagues and four lances back to back. Uh, so they were a successful team, but probably didn't get the accolades we would have liked them to get. Um, and, and I'm not surprised because um, they were very committed and very dedicated. And I, I think one of the things that people forget, like you know, you can have all the, the money in the world uh, to invest in players and strength and condition, but the decision making process is really important. And these guys were very good in 95 in the decision making and uh, this team that they have at the moment the decisions on the ball at times are crucial uh, to win games and that would have helped us over the years particularly on Sunday, on Sunday or Saturday night Yeah, people talk about the football intelligence of, of this current group how do you coach that in a team Paul? How, do, how does Jason Sherlock and Jim Gavin influence players to make good decisions under pressure? It's a difficult one it's a combination of I suppose in, in, intelligence and repeat, repetitiveness so, I mean, there would have been a lot of drills that they would have done uh, that people would understand over and over and over again and repeat themselves. Um, and if you just look at, at the example of, of, the, of the goal that uh, Owen Merchant got, I mean, there's no doubt that Peter Keane at half time said, you know, you have to man up on, on the likes of Paul Mannion and Ken uh, uh and Conor Callaghan. And, and that's what happened. They went really, really touch tight. The ball broke in the middle just from the, from the throw in. And the whole middle was wide open. And, you know, rather than the Kerry lads coming in to defend the goal, they stayed with their players because they were frightened and not that they wouldn't get the ball. And, and it opened up and we got a goal from it. And, you know, in fairness to Owen Merchant, he wasn't looking to pass the ball. It opened up and he made the decision that he was going to take the goal uh, or carry the ball as long as he possibly can. And he did the right thing by, by, by taking the shot himself. 
so it, it is one of those things that there, the thought process uh, of the of the decision making is just hugely important. You can have all the athleticism in the world, uh, but if you make the wrong decisions in the wrong times in the heat of battle, uh, you just don't win games. And, and this, this Dublin team have an abundance of that. Um, I didn't realise that Paul Bailey was your freshers coach. He was. Yeah. Did He's you win in our age now? Did you win anything? Uh, I think we won one game. <laughs> <laughs> He wasn't we, we, dealing with. We were, build, we were building blocks back then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's just say DCU wasn't the uh, behemoth it is nowadays exactly. back then. Exactly. That was in '96 or something, '95, '96, something like that. Yeah. That's back right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Years, yeah. The golden yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. We've been cracked though. Yeah. No, Paul. The, the, I have to say the 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 Cluxton thing is is going to be a big big one for for obviously the squad. Um, what your feelings on it? You know. If he goes, if he doesn't go, I know there's plenty of obviously really good goalkeepers in in the Dublin senior uh, uh, club situ, you know, kind of setup. But um, he he has been unbelievable for them. And and again, like I, you know, myself and Jerry were just saying, I think he, he's player of the year for me this year. Yeah, I, I mean, well, if I go back, I, I think he should have got more than the all. He should have got more all stars in recent years. Um, and I'm not taken away from anyone who's achieved all stars in goal, but he's he's been phenomenal in goal for us. Um, and he has he has changed the landscape as a goalkeeper, particularly with his kickouts. Um, look, at, goalkeepers can last much longer than, than outfield players. He's in great condition himself, and it's really it's really up to himself whether he he, he can stay. I, I hope he does stay. Um, he, he's a big part of that squad, uh, not so much with his, his shot stop and the kickouts or one platform, but it's what he brings. Uh, you know, when you look at the high balls that come in the last day, knowing that you know Stephen Cluxton is coming uh, to fist that ball away, and and it's obviously being well drilled that. You know that Dublin are weak with high balls coming in, and and in fairness, Kerry tested them in the first fifteen minutes. But you know, with with Cluxton coming out there and breaking those balls and coming away with them, um, it, it's something that it just gives you confidence. If you're in the full back line, you're not that nervous about your goalkeeper because he is he is the 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 the, the really confident player that you have, um, and and he'd be a huge loss. You know, he's brilliant with kickouts. He's brilliant. Um, and he shot something, but it's it's what he brings outside of that. Um, I managed him for Parnells for a couple of years in dressing rooms and that, and I've seen him uh, firsthand. And you know, he, he's not the loudest in, in a dressing room, but when he speaks, uh, everybody you wouldn't hear a pin drop. Everyone listens to what he has to say. So I've no doubt he's carried that on into in, in the inter-county scene with Dublin. Yeah, you can see there's there's a scenario where he continues and and it's not entering his head at all to leave at the moment and. And you can see him going on to his early 40s and having an amazing kind of next four or five years. But you can also see that the toll that this takes on players is much greater than we'll ever understand as well. And, and that maybe he will just decide to say, all right, I've had enough. So any, any one of a number of outcomes are here. And I think the same, Paul, goes for Jim Gavin as well. Like He was very emotional on the field afterwards, as happy as you've ever seen him. And um, like it can't be easy being the person... On whom all of the pressure sits with that Dublin setup. No, you're right. It, it, it's a phenomenal amount of pressure, um, but I do, I do think that you know that five in a row that we all talked about, and I know they weren't even allowed to mention it during the interviews throughout the whole year. Um, but a friend of mine had lunch uh, before the first game at Kieran Kilkenny and, and Dean Rock, and he said, "Paul, it was it was just." Unbelievable that they were in having lunch and there was people talking about the five in a row. He says we went out to the car park. He met people talking about the five in a row. They were crossing the road and the fella in stopped in the car talking about the five in a row. So it must have been phenomenal to try and get that out of your head and stay focused. And um, you know the weight of, of history on people's shoulders. And um, the first day uh, um, was phenomenal. And, and, and I've no doubt that you know the, the players themselves would have felt it. Um, um, and, I, and I do genuinely believe that the other one was won the first day, 14 against 15 in the last 10 minutes, that we kept ourselves in the game uh, to give ourselves a chance uh, to go on Saturday night and win that five in a row. And it, people just expressed themselves, uh, you know, the, the really good players stood up again and 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 uh, expressed themselves uh, on Saturday evening. Uh, and it was a fantastic occasion. And the pressure on Jim Gavin would have been phenomenal coming into those games. And even the changes at half time I thought were brilliant I mean he could have started Michael Darren McCauley in the middle and he didn't uh, and, he, and he moved James back and, and, and brought Howard in to keep that mobility uh, around the middle and so they were really moves that you need to give credit for the balance was still right and, and uh, you know it really what you know, for Jim to stay on 
um, I don't know what people are talking about, even him going, um, uh, you know, even the same with Stephen. I think maybe some of the country lads are wishing that they'll go and, and, and give give the rest of the country a chance. But they, they don't even need to be thinking of that. They just need to really, really enjoy what they've achieved, which is history. Uh, and they're part of that very, very um, famous team who, who, who've, who've made every player uh, very proud, uh, including the 95 lads who've been, uh, been involved with that squad. So in, it's your own instinct that you think, Paul, that they will end up staying? I, uh, there, there's no reason for them to leave. Um, you know, they, they they can all add something to it. Uh, you know, you only have to get one or two golden nuggets every year to, to keep that team um, uh, ticking over. And there's no need, there's no reason because he's achieved uh, everything that he, he needed to achieve in terms of final. Uh, the six and all doesn't have the same ring to it. And uh, uh, the seven, uh, you know, all of those those games if they are successful, but there's no need for them to even think of that. Um, and and uh, I suppose if you don't if you don't feel you know the hairs on the back of your neck, uh, you know with eighty two and a half thousand people there on Saturday night as part of a Dublin player, well then they probably will step away. And some players that does happen, you know they don't feel it anymore, so it's time to move on. And only the players themselves or the management team themselves will realise that. But there's no reason whatsoever for those guys to even be thinking that way. Okay, what what does um, what do they all bring as individuals? What Jason Sherlock's role seems to be responsible for the fluidity of the attack and obviously there's a huge basketball influence that you can see and they've, they've had basketball coaches in with the setup over the last number of years as well. You can see at various stages that there's pre-programmed moves. There's, there's just a lot of learning that they're taking from that sport. What, what, else, are, what else is Jason bringing? What's Paul Clark bringing? Well, it, it, Jason will be working with the forwards uh, consistently and, and, and Paul Clark will be working with the midfielders and the half-back line and half-forward line. Um, you know what did they bring? They've all played in those positions. Um, you know, don't forget Jim Gavin uh, when he played uh, when you know when Mead were very very strong. Graham Gerrard he was bring back Jim Gavin's role in the Leicester finals was to stop, uh, which was kind of unheard of back then to stop Graham Gerrard coming forward and, and sacrifice himself. So he knows you know what you need to do, um, uh, and so the, uh, all of those players know what they need to do. So they come with great respect. Uh, you, you know, Paul Clark's been around the team and the squad. Um, in, in the Oborn Cup, um, he's been, uh, you know, Jason Sherlock has, has been around the underage teams and, and the senior team. So they, they, they know all about systems and how they need to play. They have a fantastic backroom team. Uh, you know, Brian Cullen is a transition coach as well. So he surrounds himself with, you know, Jim Gavin as, as the captain of it, of it all and leading that. Uh, he surrounds himself with really good people who, who bring something to it. And, you know, Mick D before that was, was looking around at the defensive work and he's got there, he's got David Bourne there. So, He's got some really good people that, that that he trusts, and that's really, really important. You know, Jim trusts that the advice that they would give to players around the squad uh, are hugely important, and that's the important bit. I think those those three guys in particular now are, are you know, because they won all Ireland together, uh, they trust each other, and, and, and that's really, really important. And then the respect that those players get, uh, uh, or those players give uh, um, to, to Paul Clark, Jason, and, and Jim is, is, is rightly deserved. Yeah, Paul, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers, thanks, Sheriff. Cheers, yeah. Paul. Paul, Paul Beelan giving us some thoughts on uh, his teammates from 1995. Desi Farrell, obviously, the other one there that um, like is in the shake-up if something, yeah. if something does happen. Um, Desi was involved with the hurlers, I know, this year um, in the backroom team there. And obviously, he'd be a natural fit you know, you would think, would know a lot of those lads from obviously the under-21 teams over the years. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's quite amazing when you look at it. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of fellas there and there's a lot of guys obviously involved and have been involved. But that, but that, they're the go-to fellas you usually go to. You know, you look, I mean, you, you come into a management setup, you think, who can I trust? Who do I know has is made of the right stuff? Who can convey a message? Who's who's good with people? Um, and you surround yourself. Like, it's it's it's... Sam and Jason obviously played together with in St Oliver Plunkett's and Mick Gavin or Mick uh, Gavin was the the manager uh, who was on that squ- team as well and uh, Jason used to talk about Jim Gavin right. and said like you know he's he's a really funny character and all this kind of stuff and it, it, like I've heard that a bit you know and I only met him briefly um, and they were good friends you know they were very very good friends so obviously they moved that on and they were always talking about the game and obviously like Jason's I think Jason's influence is, 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 is pretty serious especially with the forwards and the movement of the forwards and he would have always been a guy like that you know even in the dressing room before games or in the lead up to games he was constantly thinking about how the actual forward unit 
um, of a club team can improve. So he's obviously bringing that into into a setup. And I heard him talking yesterday, saying that they all want to learn, they all want to improve, they all want to get better. Um, when you're surrounded by that, that's a, that's a pretty powerful dynamic to have in a squad where yeah. people aren't. They're not second guessing you. They're not even questioning the fact. They're just saying, "Yeah, give me more. Give me more. You know, I want to learn. Whether they have the capacity to learn or not, and really layer up, but they seem to have. Like, I mean, their intelligence level is is a big thing as well. I think there's a high intelligence level, and generally with winning teams, you get a you get a relatively high IQ across the team because people have to take on a lot of information relatively quickly. And in, you know, small bursts. Yeah. It, it, it's not like you have that team all week. Exactly. It's not like you can go in and sit and take somebody aside. Uh, that's why those kind of trips away are so beneficial because you've got a couple of days where you actually do have a half an hour where you can go in to somebody and say, we're just going to show you these three videos now where you do this thing repeatedly. Maybe you should try this other thing yeah. and do that a bit more. Well, to get Kieran Daly wrote a good article, I don't know if it was yet, in the Examiner where he was saying that one of the great things about, obviously, the conditioning of the Dublin team is that is, is, is the length of the season as well. Like, one of the big things for me this year getting into the Super 8s, I had to get me to, <laughs> was the fact that the squad are together then yeah, yeah. For, a cons- for an extended period of time. Like, this is some of the part things that people don't see. So you have all the meetings, inv- never mind the training sessions, you have all the meetings with that. You have the touch points with regard to the S&C coaches, the physios, the... The, the one-on-ones that you can potentially do. And then the video evidence to show them afterwards. Oh, massive, massive. So all of that, that, that just, you know, instead of being knocked out in June or July, you actually have an extended run of another five or six or seven weeks where you're having maybe 20 or 30 more chances to actually, you know, put your blueprint onto a team. Like, and people talk about two-tier championships. Like, you know, and I know we're a little, little bit off the point here, but if you are a second-tier champion or a second-tier team and you're trying to improve, you're not going to improve getting knocked out of the championship every year in June yeah. because you're not together. No. So, and why the then? Opposite. Why would you be a sponsor? Like, why would you say, do you know what? I'm going to sponsor that team. Like myself and yourself decide we're going to have a blueprint for Kildare, and we go to Intel, and we've we've done a, a really serious presentation. Part of that is, listen, I want you to come on a journey with us with Kildare, it may take five years, it may take ten years. Here's the money where we need it. Money's going to go down into development squads, money's going to go into the, whatever it is, right? And it, money's going to go to the senior team. We may be in the second year, I'm not saying that, but we may be it. But what we're going to do is we're going to have so many meetings, so many to, we're going to improve, we're going to get out of that, we're going to win that, that's our first aim. Then we're going to get into the other stuff and we're going to, like, you all of a sudden, every, every county should be aspiring to that. Every county should be aspiring to try and keep a group of players involved as long as you can. Okay, now, I know I'm jumping around because the club stuff is obviously very important, but it's the same thing with the club. Yeah, It's the same thing. It doesn't matter what team it is. You can't just have bursts here and then off you go and there's nothing going on in the summer and then you just come back in for a, a quick fire round of three or four weeks. It should be, here's a period of time, we're going to get as much as we can within that period of time. Um, and it makes it, obviously beneficial for everyone involved, be it sponsors, be it coaches, be it whoever. Yeah, no, it works. In terms of how catchable they are, say, say Cluxon stays and say Jim Gavin stays and say, you know, the four of those um, players retire who we've been talking about and there's a bunch of under 20s, um, under 21s to, to come up. Um, how how do you make them automatic favourites next year if the majority of that team can say Connolly comes back and plays a full year? I think they're they're favourites again next year, absolutely. Um Are they heavy favourites? I don't think I don't think they're heavy favourites. Uh if you're saying if Cluxon and Gavin go. If they no. stay, if they oh, stay. If they stay, well I think I think either way I don't I would still wouldn't make them heavy favourites. Um the, the, the first thing that you, uh, uh, the first thing that you require to to get up to the standard of Dublin is you need the conditioning levels, and the conditioning levels just that, that just doesn't mean fitness. It means power. It means stamina. It means all those different things. It means physique. It means the ability to get hit over seventy minutes and be able to go again. Um, and you need not just fifteen, but you need twenty five guys who are at that level. That's the first thing. I think teams are getting there. So you've got your Donegal, your Tyrone, your Mayo, um, your Kerry, obviously. Cork will come, there's no doubt about it, um, and you need success like that. You need to be able to say, yeah, you're picking these guys, as, as, as Paul just said, cherry-picking fellas off the conveyor belt who are going, mm, these guys can make a difference, no matter what age. Like, look yeah. at Clifford, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22 years of age. If you've got the size, the speed, the power, the stamina, the agility, and the skill, above all, you will make a difference. So I think, I think it is catching. 
there isn't that glaringly obvious, I think, gap. Um, and I think the coaching of teams is getting a lot better. And the management around teams and the thinking around teams and the, the ability to understand kickouts and where we can actually press a team and where we can actually take some weapons away from a team. And I think, you know, Kerry and certainly some of the others have shown that there are frailties in the, in, in, in the Dublin, as, as there are in every team. Yeah. Trying to expose them is a different thing, yeah. and exposing them consistently is a different thing. And having the players to do that, correct, to execute yeah. the plan. So, but yeah. that's but that's the challenge for everyone. Yeah, and hopefully some teams are up to it next year in a way that they haven't been uh, recently. Right, Saturday's final wasn't obviously the only All Ireland that Dublin GA brought home this weekend. Yesterday, in the rain, Dublin beat Galway in the All Ireland Ladies final to secure their third title in a row. Here's their manager Mick Bowen and Siobhan McGrath. I think everyone said it was but that's hard to watch, it was hard to play. Um, the, I don't think the conditions helped, but um, obviously there's a lot of errors that would have happened that were not really one for us or it wouldn't have been happened like in better conditions, but like said, the ball was breaking down and we back on the back foot. But um, no, it was it was just great to get over the line. Um, it was a tough game, it was, it was constant going up and down the pitch, but um, just, yeah, happy, delighted for the girls, so proud of them that we just got over the line. What was your attitude at half time? Um, we knew we needed to up our work rate. It wasn't good enough what we were doing. We were hanging off. Like maybe there wasn't a nerves that kicked in at the start, but we weren't. We weren't playing true to our form. So we needed to. We needed to just lift it. And um, we knew what we had to do going into the second half. And I think we start playing a bit more expansively and bringing our game to the to the forum. Were the memories of those finals where you guys have been there and gone so close and things not going your way? Those one point two point losses against Cork. Does that come into your mind when you're playing the second half and you know you got to go? deep into those reserves to find whatever you have to pull out that win um, I don't think I don't, to be honest with you I don't think that's what we like think about deep down I think we've learned from that that's, that's happened and we have moved on and they have made us a stronger team for sure but going in there into the second half I don't think there was that that wasn't in people's back of people's mind I think we just knew what we needed to do to go out and beat the team that was in front of us and uh, it was a happy week we did it these women are strong now they're going to the gym as often as the men it's an awful shame sometimes they're not allowed to show their strength and use it well if you asked our group I know they're exactly what they tell you uh, they would feel there's nowhere near enough contact allowed in the game uh, and if you look at situations the first, first half we got called four times you know inside the D area for driving through a tackle and in the men's game you drive through it, you offload, you get a score. Today, you did it and you were penalised on a free out. And that's nothing against the referee on the day. They're the rules of the game and it's up to us, obviously, to play with them. But my point being on those conditions, it does make it so much more difficult. Yeah, the conditions are not great and they still managed to get a, a record crowd for us. So um, it was a goal to a point at halftime and you can just see how disappointed the players were in their inability to rise above the occasion and to rise above the conditions. But the conditions were absolutely horrific. Like, you know, with TV, you kind of go, you know, is it raining? Yeah. <laughs> it was like, oh, it's raining. Yeah. It was absolutely raining. Um, but actually, like, I mean, the, the goal Dublin got in those conditions was absolutely fantastic. Lindsay Davy then, some of the moves, some of the, the, the she, was, she was jinking inside players, some of her ball control, actually a lot of the girls' ball control was absolutely fantastic, but in the conditions where you know, you, you, you're told obviously don't bounce the ball, the ball's gonna skid away from you. Yeah. Um, but they're, 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 like I mean, it was, a, it was, a, it was definitely a, a, a tenacious battle and it was a kind of a battle where there were just a battle of attrition in the conditions. But some of the scores, some of the goals they did get, uh, like there's the, the goal, um, the, 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 that girl, sorry, the number six for Dublin. Um, Big Odrick. Yeah, she, the goal like was just, talk about bravery, because the ball gets popped across from, corner forward gets it, pops it across to her, there's three Galway girls converging on her. Um, she goes up and she catches it and the three Galway girls like, are coming in and they, they actually take each other out. Three of them end up on the ground. She grabs it. There's another Galway girl coming in and she manages to get the kick off and she actually ends up, it kind of, it's half blocked and it goes in over the goalkeeper. But massive bravery and athleticism from her because she actually gets the ball, gets it down to her foot really, really well. Um, that's a, it's a pretty, they lost three in a row, Dublin. You know, they lost three in a row. That is, that's heartbreaking. Yeah. And, and to come back and then win three in a row. And uh, that Cork team are obviously making a bit of a comeback themselves as well. So there's a, yeah. there is a rivalry there, but um, 
did Meath win? I don't know if they did or not. No, they lost, unfortunately. Right. Yeah, so yeah. now Dublin are the only senior county in Leinster. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is not great. No, it's not great. They lost, unfortunately, Tipperary. Uh, it was a great, great game. Uh, the weather wasn't as bad at that stage. Uh, it was still slippy. The, the, the conditions weren't great, but there were some fantastic scores. Meath were right in it, right in it, and then uh, Tipperary got a goal. Um, just a bit of a bad mistake. A hand pass got intercepted, and they got a goal, and that kind of took the wind out of their sails. But uh, they, were, they were fairly well tanked by Tipperary last year, so they'll, you know, they're they're improving. And yeah. they're, they're getting there. Tipperary have been very, very strong all year in that division. To be fair, yeah, it's uh, it'll be a concern when the the showpiece can generate such hype and attention and bums on seats that the other counties in Leinster are falling further behind Dublin because, like, the whole point about the sport, as we know, you need rivalries, you need teams to be interested to. Yeah, but I, I think I think though, look, it's it's the conversation we just had yesterday, and you know, I was I was. Uh, castigated on Twitter a little bit yesterday where I was kind of saying listen that, that Dublin are, are the standard bearers are the standard bearers in the ladies now as well um, and it is down to other county boards it's down to clubs it's down to sponsorship about trying to raise the levels like I, the, the Mead team are, are, are improving um, but again it's about trying to say okay what do we need to do to bridge that gap um, and finance and funding and etc is going to be a big part of that yeah no totally and uh, absolutely we'll, we'll definitely be coming back to that issue later on uh, in the year. It's 8.44 this morning. Alan Quillen is in the studio next. We're going to be hearing from Owen Sheehan in Japan as well. Greg Feek, the scrum coach, has been chatting about Robbie Henshaw this morning. Have a look. Yeah, so Robbie's looking uh, unlikely for this weekend, obviously. Um, but uh, obviously we just got back from training and um, we're still sorting things out. But um, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's reasonably positive in, in terms of what we saw. So, um, you know, the, some of these guys... Um, day by day, week by week, things can improve dramatically um, than the average human. So uh, we'll just take it like that at the moment. Um, uh, give, uh, we'll see how it goes over the next few days, and then maybe reassess in the, in, in the near, not too distant future. Greg, can we say whether it's a great one, two, three, or one? Uh, not at the stage. Yeah, we're just doing. Um, it's kind of. Uh, I haven't been given the, the full brief on whether I can say that, so I'm better off not. You generally wouldn't share that level of detail um, for any injury information. Okay. But he is, he is not he's not going to be returning to Ireland. That's not, that's not a risk. Yeah, yeah. so you, you're stocked up enough no matter what that, that you can kind of carry a guy like Robbie because of your percentage, you can carry him for whatever amount of time. Yeah, I mean, as you know, the, our, our collective has always been something we pride ourselves on and, and we back everybody to, to fill a spot. Um, the beauty is, and this time, this every four years, you get to spend a lot of pre-season together as well. So everyone knows their roles really well. So uh, you, you know, and that's that's what happens. We just got to back whatever happens uh, in terms of personnel. Okay, what's the best case scenario? In terms of games or how long? Um, I know what game he'd be targeting. Do you know what I mean? And and again. You know, it's still it's still early days. You know, uh, we still have hopes for for next week. You know, so we'll um, we'll just like I said, we'll just go day by day at this stage, and then you'll probably get a better update after this weekend. Yeah. So uh, great big uh, trying not to give too much away there. Um, <laughs> not really sure what I'm allowed to say was basically what he was saying. Uh, but they seem positive about Robbie Henshaw all of a sudden. As yeah, in, like, I think there's not going home anyway. Yeah, the scan obviously showed that um, there's not uh, a huge amount of damage done, and if there was, the, he, he would be replaced. You know, if it was a significant tear, so he'll miss miss the Scottish game, and um, he may be back after that. They're not under as much pressure after that. The same type of pressure, even though Japan will be tricky, and um, if you could get him back for Russia or something like that, it'd be. It'd be a bonus from, but um, it's a month to the quarterfinal. Am I am I tempting fate here by looking forward to the the weekend of the nineteenth of October? That's the quarterfinal weekend. Yeah, but if he's only tweaked it, he might only be two weeks. You know, mm. he might might be as long. And I think they might be. That's probably the information that they're getting. Um, if he was bad, he's gone. That's it. You can't afford to just at this stage. You can't afford to be carrying people. Yeah, too. Too long. If it was a doubt that it could be four to six weeks, he's gone. Yeah. Um, so they obviously have information that it might only be two to three. Yeah. Some something around that, and he might do rehab this week, and he may train the following week. So that's obviously what they're. You know, he's not giving a lot away there because he can't really. Sometimes you are. There is a bit of a chance here with this, 
um, and he's had issues with the hamstring before. I don't know which, if it's the same one or another one. Um, but it's a tricky injury as well. It is, Some yeah. lads react differently to, to, to physio and stuff and get quicker. You know, yeah, back, I, back I back pulled a hamstring, I'd say, once in my life. Um, I wasn't moving quick enough to, <laughs> to, uh, to probably uh, damage my hamstrings. But I remember I played Leinster one time in the, old Leinster, lads, <laughs> <hamstrings, I'd say. laughs> in the old, old uh, Lansdowne Road and I felt yeah. tear or pull or something and there was bruising on it so it was there was definitely something done and I played two weeks later it was like I just you know it was it wasn't significant damage it was obviously just a few fibers around the hamstring obviously if you pull the main body the hamstring you can't just come back after two weeks so he would hope it's something like that and uh, I think Joe Joe was saying that he wasn't going full tilt that he when it happens kind of yeah. stopped up you know when you're going full tilt it's different if you get that pull it's Ups, yeah it, there's, there's obviously a bigger, but it's bad news and it's disappointing because I think, um, and it's amazing the way things change. You know, um, everyone's saying Henshaw, Aki, for yeah, that first Scottish game, yeah. and like, would you have any issue with Gary Ringrose slipping not. in there? You know I what I mean? Know. And probably some would argue that for that bit of creativity that he probably should start anyway. Yeah. And yeah, um, so it's not a major issue, I think. It's a disappointment because I love the way Henshaw plays. He's all action. He's covering defence. is phenomenal. Um, and I think he's there's a real hunger and desire for him to try and get back and play regularly. And he affects games, you know. So he's a loss and he's a leader for that team. Um, but they have a bit of cover, which is good. Yeah. Good cover. Yeah, yeah, in fairness, and the fact that they have four centres in the squad now looks yeah, like Yeah, and people there. spoke, Ger, beforehand about maybe oh, should you only bring three centres and more backfield players. I think the the option of putting one of them out in the wing or full back is easier than bringing someone in yeah. to the centre, you know what I mean? We know Keith Earls can play in the centre as well, Larimer can play in the centre, but I'd rather be putting fellas out than bringing them in from the outer, outer channels. Yeah. Um, okay, I wanted to ask you about a couple of things that happened over the weekend as well. Most notably your column on Saturday, which um, pointed out the long history of doping in South African rugby and how it is an issue that we should be talking about. It, it is a bit mad that like um, this kind of <coughs> bubbles under the surface in South African rugby and then it flares up obviously when one of their players recently um, gets popped for, uh, it, uh, the description was a, a cocktail of substances. Um, and it's no big deal. It's kind of like yeah, and we can talk. We, we and we can talk about it now because I think with the first te sample, the A sample, you you have to give guys the benefit of the doubt to get the second sample tested. You know, because sometimes it can possibly be a mistake or some something gone wrong. The second sample comes back the same result. So I think hmm. he's still pleading his innocence, and I, I I don't know. It just hit me because you know, look. I've, I've, people often, and, and this is a very debatable subject because people on the outside say, well, oh, rugby players, there's doping in rugby. And there probably is. I'm sure there is. There's absolutely no doubt there is. I've never seen it throughout my group, my time. And people then say, oh, Quinlan never, never saw doping. But what did they want me to say? I saw doping. Well, I'm I mean, out of the game now, and like the thing is, you wouldn't see it unless you were doing it yourself with a mate, right? Yeah, and but I like, think. But Jerry, the other thing, and Raj said this before: if you were with a group of people for 10, 12 years, <sighs> like we were, I was there fifteen years. Raj was there probably the same. We, like, there's a group there that's there for for so long, particularly in Munster. We're training together all the time. We're in the gym together all the time. What I was trying to make the point was, like, if somebody is lifting 120 bench press or 130 bench press and they come back and that's their max. And we all know because we're competitive and we're trying to get the extra two and a half kilos. And the gym is, is a competitive place as well. Um, and somebody comes back to fall a few months later and they're lifting 160, 170. <laughs> well, then you go, what the hell is going on here? Eat some and my, my, <laughs> uh, based on my experience, I never saw that kind of massive gains or somebody didn't come back after pre-season and go, Jesus, he has gone months, months, yeah. huge like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and like, I can't say it any differently. Is there guys that maybe in that group that could have taken something? There's always a possibility for sure. There's guys probably, is there guys in the Irish team at the moment? Of course there is. 
there's I don't know the details of the masking agents and you know you'd have to get a medical person on to describe what you can take and what you can't take and I never went and kind of educated myself on that because I didn't feel the need didn't to need yeah. to what why, why would I um, I do know that the testing has increased um, by the RFU and to be fair to them and I've no skin in the game with the RFU the the user pay system which is a an extra payment system that you can bring in, they are using that. They, so they're paying the user pay system. They're investing money to do extra tests aside from Sport Ireland. Yeah. Okay. There's a what, does that, what does that involve? It involves basically additional tests. Right. So the standard number of tests that Sport Ireland do, the random tests, the pay, user pay system can target as well. So if Anthony Miles is, after making this big increase, you can be targeted. You can your name can be given to to the user pay system through Sport and the Ireland IRFU as well. Will foot the bill for that testing. And they pay, and, they and, pay and, extra for. And who would give my name? Can that be like? Would that be a bit of a you know? Listen, well, it could you be someone in the IRFU. Yeah, it right. could be officials right. in the IRFU. Um, and I, so you can target, or they can specifically say, the, 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 like I would have been tested a lot. I don't know why they were testing me because I didn't have the, the body of a kind of a bodybuilder or someone who made all these gains. Um, your hamstring recovery. The power. hamstring recovery, <laughs> yeah, the powers. But, you know, I just randomly got tested and, you know, I didn't, you know, a number of times. Most of the guys would have probably been tested four or five times throughout their number of years or whatever, which people would argue that's not a lot. Um, I was tested out of competition a few times. I was in Clonakilty one time in, in the Inchidani Hotel for a few days. I got tested down there. It was a random test. Um, did you get? Was it really random, or did they let you know in advance? Was there a tip of it? There was no, no, because when you ha and what changed throughout, probably not in the earlier days. What changed over a number of years was basically you have to fill out a form. The whereabouts form, yeah. If you're, if you're unavailable, if you're not at your house, um, you have to let them know holidays, place you go in Ireland, and and that happens. But look, there is no doubt. And a few people tweeted me after the weekend saying. Well, just because we have had no positive high-profile tests in Ireland doesn't mean we're doesn't clean. Mean we're clean. Yeah, look but there's two questions there I would ask, Jer. Does it mean we're clean or does it mean we're, like we're adhering to, 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 to anti-doping here? Do, like there's no doubt about it that everybody, the, the probably, you know, everybody is not probably clean. No, I would but say... the vast majority, I would say a high number are... Um, and I'd say uh, people were criticising then a few South African people tweeted me saying, well, your target specifically kind of gone on about a photo that was there. I'm not. Hit the Google button for anyone that doesn't know and you will see a list of high profile international rugby players who have failed uh, uh, drugs tests. Hit the Google button for Ireland and you'll see none. Now, some people said to me about Frankie Sheehan as well. Some people tweeted. Um, and he was cleared on appeal, and it was proven that it was um, um, the form was not filled out properly by the doctor. So he should have had a TUE, but didn't. Was the yeah, the, basically, the, and, and he the had him for, he, for, he had him right up to that. That was against Toulouse in a semi final. So it's a very debatable subject. My point is, when it continuously keeps happening in South Africa, there's an issue there. Yeah. So uh, argue whatever you, you want. What, sake, if, what if they I win the, the clue? What if they win the World Cup and we're like? But it's not suggesting. It's not suggesting that that group were all. No, it's not. And but none that, of them that could, maybe the, are. The, the rugby culture that they culture represent. And Ger, when you have fourteen-year-olds taking steroids in South Africa, which has happened, the Craven Week, the Schools Week. So don't we, get me wrong. Yeah. I'm not saying that this South African team <clears> and and you know you can make gains in gyms. You can condition your body. You can get six packs. You can make. Um, you know, through incredible training, you can. So, some people can, Alan. But it, yeah, but is the picture, you know, the, the, which I'm sure you're talking about, like, is that just bad taste or is it is stupidity or is it kind of no, like, well, the, actually, you know do what? you know what? Do you know what the people are saying that I'm talking because of, I'm not talking because of any picture. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. because the 2018 Young Player of the Year the breakout tested player. positive In for a concoction yeah. of, of, of steroids in his, in his, yeah. in his wow. system. And yeah, you as I said, hit the Google button. You'll see a, a list and repeat offenders. Um, there's a couple of them there who've been tested twice, uh, failed drug tests twice, and they've gone back playing. 
it's just, it's unbelievable. You know, we saw with Gerbrand Grobler last year, came to Munster. And you know what? I gave him credit at the time. One of the few who put the hands up and said, yes, I am guilty. Can I just say... It's not in my toothpaste, it's not say, in my meat, it's not in my can supplements. Can I just say he didn't put his hands up properly? He put his hands up and said, I did it. I didn't... He did he didn't, say... He didn't say where he got it. You'd love to say, yeah, but I suppose... You gave it to him. How many other of his teammates were and doing you see, it? If he you, did none of that. Absolutely. So, right. Exactly, but... And can, now, that many, now that you brought it up, right? How many, how, Ger, how many people do say though? The IRFU signed a known doper from South Africa and injected him into Irish rugby culture on purpose. Okay. That's what they did. That's, that's, I can't defend that. Like, that's what, that happened. But how many people... Are we going to sign Deante Ger, now? Ger. He's, he's going to be great in four years time. The question I ask is, how many people who fail drugs tests actually hold their hands up? Well, he didn't. He, 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 he admitted he, it. Yeah. Like, but he oh, didn't. I mean, when you get caught, how many of them say? So very few. I took very, very few. few. So very few. Everybody says, so look, it was uh, contaminated. Most of them, it's, or whatever, a, uh, the it's in your meat, uh, supplements, toothpaste. Yeah. I read some athlete recently saying that he could get it from particles in the air. Some runner, or sprinter in America. Yeah. Didn't um, didn't somebody get it from kissing somebody one time as well? Yeah. Wasn't there so, a... look, it's it's uh, <laughs> it's not it's it's not. There's something. a lot of no nos there. Yeah. So look, I, I I will be concerned if South Africa win this World Cup that um, that there's a system which is producing teenagers who think that they need to dope to get into it. Six positive drug te tests in 2018 at Craven Week yeah. out of 122 tested. Six positive tests. And this is not just a, a, a shock system. Over so, the years, three, four, five, every year. Look, my, my thing 17, is this... 18 year old testimony, somebody asked me also about the school system. The school system here in Ireland you probably need more tests, but the tests have increased and they are being tested. They're are being they tested being tested? The they are, yeah. I can give you the numbers if you want. Have we time? For the, for the does does rugby World are... Rugby also test on it or is it down to yes, the actual yeah. specific countries? So at countries. the tournament now, World yeah. Rugby, EPCR will test as well in Europe, but internally in Ireland, it's Sport Ireland that do the tests here yeah. in the schools, um, the I club thought the game. schools were somehow out of the system. No, they're not. There's. Uh, I, I thought the schools players could only be tested at the provinces. That they're not actually getting tested at the schools during the games. Is that not right? I don't know the specifics of that. I just have the numbers for the, scary the, thing the for amount for of schools players who have been tested in in um, in 2017 uh, for the last couple of years. You could argue they they need to increase. Uh, look, uh, they have increased though, mm -hmm. and this isn't me painting this covering over this dark cloud that that. Uh, and, and saying it doesn't go on. It's probably gone on. There's a big problem in rugby, Ger, with amateur players who are maybe trying to make the leap up, and I would be very concerned about the school level. That jump up now to be the next Sexton Murray, uh, to make a half a million a year, it's, very enticing. it's enticing, you know, and if there's, you know, people will cheat. Oh, look, uh, it makes but sense. I don't think we have a systematic drug problem here. I would say we I definitely think have a problem, though. And I, I think I, there's a problem in South Africa, yeah. and that's proven by what you see. There's, I think it's the right thing to do is to be sceptical until I'll until tell you a quick wrong. one. Henry Stanson, South African, 21-year-old, he signs for Stade Francais last year. Sensational in the top 14. Um, tested positive in May. For, against Montpellier for concoction of steroids. Again, 21-year-old. Yeah, it's pretty grim. Right, uh, well, two quick things. Dennis Leamy is joining Munster, is joining Leinster, a uh, Freudian slip. Um, he's joining the Leinster backroom team? Well, we feel that Leinster needs um, a few more Munster <laughs> guys in there to help him a little Are bit more. Are you trying to yeah. take over from the inside? Is that the yeah, idea? We're, we're sending him <laughs> in as a north. spy. We're sending him in as a spy. Um, well, it's it's... And that, it's it's a great opportunity for him, you know. Dennis is someone I have incredible admiration for and respect for, and uh, he has a lot to offer the game. And if he's if it's true, it's Munster's loss, I think, and Leinster's gain. We'll get Felix Jones in next. Yeah, he could go. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> is there a disappointment when some of your former teammates end up not end up getting their opportunity through Munster? That actually. Yeah, look, I think f uh, f you 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 I. A lot of the boys I would have played with, I'd love to see him back involved with Munster, but that's not always the case, and there might not be an opportunity or an opening there, so that's just the way the business, that's just the way it is now that people move around from well, the playing point talk of view, about and some of the coaches do. Dublin there, with Jim Gavin and the 95 team. Yeah. Like, I mean, that team, obviously those teams you were, like, I mean, the, you know, from an out, you're kind of going, some obvious people here, we you just like to have around? 
you know. And I know you don't. You'd lift it, it doesn't it. necessarily make him good coaches either. No, it you doesn't. know. But no. and and at the end of the day, you know, Munster can only they make their own decisions and they but they can only so many of them facilitate sure. you can't facilitate guys for the sake of and to be fair to Dennis he's gone like really back to grassroots rugby with Cashel with Clanmel uh, Clanmel Cashel Rockwell Gary Owen and Limerick um, and working with Munster then and uh, you know he's he's kind of really rolled the sleeves up and, and he loves coaching he loves being out in the field so um, it's a great opportunity for him now to kind of progress his, his coaching career on another bit. Yeah, no, it's great to have him back uh, involved at that level. Um, and then there's a baby oil story that we need to talk about, is there? Do you know anything about this? Uproarious moment at the Springbok presser as a Kiwi journalist asks, Warren Gatland has been putting baby oil in his balls. I mean, his rugby balls. Have you been doing anything similar? <laughs> <laughs> Wales rugby team trained with balls covered in baby oil. <laughs> oh my goodness. Because conditions are going to be tricky at the Rugby World Cup. Not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea, yeah. For no. The humidity. Probably no. too. I'm glad it's the rugby balls. Yeah. I'm glad that was uh, clarified. Who knows? <laughs> he did, who knows? He did put fake tan on the Irish rugby team to go to go to South Africa in 2000 <laughs> or in 1998. You're kidding To me. make them look bigger and get all their heads shaved. And did he? Most of the boys. I was on standby for that, and that was that was the call that the heads were going to be shaved tight, and and there was going to be fake tan. <laughs> It wasn't compulsory, but it was suggested, so... Yeah, so you would have been pre-Gavin pre yeah. Henson, the yeah, first yeah. proper... He just wanted to yeah. get his own done. championship haircut to a whole new level. Right, we're going to get you a set of headphones, Alan, but in the meantime, we can uh, head to Japan, to our man in Japan. Owen, where are you? I am in Chiba, Jar. Very good morning to the three of you in studio. This is where Ireland have been living. This is where Ireland have been training. Their hotel there is the one uh, just over my shoulder. Uh, it's uh, a province all of its own, Chiba. We know it well from the 2002 World Cup. It's where the football team trained for a while. There was actually famously a bus that the soccer team got in 2002, and it was after Saipan and all of that. And there was 10 members of the Ireland starting team painted on the bus. They actually had to undo the spray paints to get rid of Roy Keane in that <laughs> case. That's the only thing I remember uh, of Chiba. Uh, so the rugby team are back here, and by all accounts, the facilities that they're training on, the, the hotel itself that they're staying in, is absolutely fantastic. It is a little bit out of the way. I have had to trek out here uh, a couple of the days. It's about an hour and a half out from the city centre in Tokyo. And when you get here for the first time, it does kind of take you back a little bit. It kind of feels a little bit Soviet. And uh, people who live in Chiba won't uh, thank me for saying that. But the more time you spend here, the more you realise, actually, it's kind of a nice place. There was a massive crowd here yesterday, for example, for a huge gaming conference. Uh, and really, when you kind of uh, look around the place, it's, it's a pretty nice place. Disneyland is uh, right over that way. And that's the first thing you see when you cross over the river from Tokyo. Uh, how did you, what was your experience like of watching the all Ireland football final and have you recovered? Hmm. Uh, the all Ireland football final, I'm not going to lie, was an absolute and complete disaster. Even if Kerry had won, I still would be saying this. So uh, there's a, a couple of Irish bars uh, around the city and I got in touch with a few of them, but they said, no, 2 a.m. is just a little bit too late to show the all Ireland football final replay. And I was like, OK, fair enough. And then I got tipped off by somebody who's in the know that there would be a bar showing this. And it was called uh, Geronimo Shop Bar in uh, Rapongi is the name of the area. So uh, I get a train down to Rapongi on Saturday night. And I bump into an Irish person immediately. And um, he, he's, I, I immediately start to see that this place is a little bit seedy, this, this area in Rapongi. And uh, I say to him, this kind of seems like the Temple Bar of Tokyo. And he's like, oh, God, no, it's way worse than that. <laughs> and it was like the, the seediest place I've ever been in my life. I go up to this place, Geronimo Shop Bar, and I immediately knew we had a problem. The, the, the stream well, didn't even get to the point where it was buffering. And I was like, screw this. And I got in the taxi home and ended up miss, missing the first 15 minutes. Um, your uncle Kenny had put over his man of the match performance. I, three or four points, I think, was it in the first 20 yeah, minutes or so? Three, yeah. uh, but I, I got, the, I got the, the, the remaining three quarters anyway. So I, I avoided most of the disaster. Yeah, so commiserations, you know. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Kerry will be haunted by the first game for some time to come, regardless of age profile. You would have taken them all out and find it at the start of the year, but they don't do moral... Well, you, you, that's kind of a moral victory there, you know. You're trying to get a moral victory out of it, but you're, you're not really into it. Uh, that, that's, that's why I'm not an inter-county footballer. I don't have that level of ruthlessness that's, uh, that's required there that I've shown in that tweet. Actually, the more I thought about it, the more after I tweeted, it, I was like, actually, no, they kicked away both games. I'm, I'm going to go with that. I'm going to say, actually... On, on second look, looking at some of the statistics, uh, particularly when it comes to Kerry's conversion rate, they also kicked away the second game. So Fair screw enough. you, Dublin, basically, is what I'm saying. Fair enough. You're, you're miles, miles away. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll leave you at that one. The Japanese papers this morning, is there any mention of anything to do with the Rugby World Cup? 
Well, actually, there is. I'm quite surprised. There hasn't really been much uh, of a mention. So you've got only one English-speaking uh, newspaper here, the Japan Times, uh, and that has a little sidebar on the rugby. But this particular uh, documentation here, I'm not sure whether it's read it from front to back or back to front. I think it's uh, back to front in the middle has a big spread on how to play rugby. So uh, I'm going to pour over this. This is very helpful uh, for me. All, all, all the rules and regulations, the breakdown, uh, greatly explained there. It uh, looks to be, uh, I don't know, a Samoa or a France game against Japan that they've used for all the pictures. You can see the spring box, our picture there. So if you are in Japan and don't know the rules of rugby, this particular paper here, I don't know what it's called, uh, is covering <laughs> that. Uh, but as you can see, kind of on the, the back page of that newspaper, it's a picture from the Japanese marathon. And that is kind of dominating proceedings across the back pages uh, this morning here. Uh, you've got this other one that looks kind of like the, the New York Times, but uh, for people living in Japan, uh, which has kind of got the volleyball in the middle. It was a good day for the Japanese volleyball team, by all accounts, yesterday. Uh, on the front and back of their newspaper, though, they've got pictures of uh, the marathon, as I uh, have already mentioned, that was taking place somewhere in Japan yesterday. The Marathon Grand Championship uh, is what it's called. Uh, like, the, Here's another one. This is like the most wackiest looking newspaper I've ever seen. Look at this. There you go. That really popped the shelf. Uh, M9, I think, means like inning number nine or something. There was two runs, including a home run. I presume that the four runs came from the home run uh, in the match uh, for the Lions against the Mariners yesterday in the Japanese Baseball League. So they're uh, leading with that uh, particular one. If you go a couple of pages in, though, they do have a bit of rugby here. And uh, Jacob Stockdale is uh, pictured here in this particular Japanese paper. I tried to translate it, but the, the translation that I'm using is a disaster to the point where it translated Ulster to Squirrel. Uh, I don't know how that managed to, to happen. You've also got a lot of sumo there yesterday. We'll have a piece on OTBAM about sumo later in the week. I was at the Autumn Championship last night. And then there's a couple of other specialty papers. This is basically the Japanese version of the Racing Post. Uh, it's wall-to-wall -wall coverage of racing, obviously a huge uh, industry here. And then uh, a very wet, kind of damp uh, from rain. Uh, the footballing uh, magazine here from Japan as well, um, focusing on the J-League. So that's the look at the papers this morning. Uh, they're all non-English speaking papers, obviously, except for the Japan Times. But we're starting to see a few ripples, uh, ripples now that the Rugby World Cup is in fact taking place in this country. It seems that there is a few more posters, I want to say, a few more things uh, hanging off uh, barriers and stuff here that would suggest that the, the tournament is here. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all good. And I'm sure once the Ireland fans start arriving in the next couple of days, it's really going to start exploding. You've uh, been at a press conference this morning where Robbie Henshaw was the main focus, obviously. Yeah, he was. It was uh, the main question uh, for Greg Feek, which we heard a little bit uh, earlier on. He says that he's uh, still recovering. We won't get a full picture, really, of uh, Robbie Henshaw and his fitness at, at any point. We have heard the, the line once again about personal data and uh, information being shared by people. But uh, I got this question in uh, about Jean Klein in, at the end of Greg Feek's press conference. Uh, Greg, the, the aftermath of uh, the, the squad getting announced, uh, there was a lot of talk about Sean Klein and uh, the tight head lock in terms of that role as a scrummager. Uh, specifically, what does he bring to the, that specific uh, position as a tight head lock? Because that seems to be the phrase of the hour. Is it really? Honto? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think it's been talked about as well, and I think Joe spoke about it, Simon, the players. And I think, for me, I'm really just reiterating what they're, they're saying. And obviously, tight head lock. People see, oh, he's just there to do that role, but it's kind of like that Luke Thompson role. You know what I mean? Someone that can, um, I suppose, be confrontational, physical, do the do the hard yards and compliment um, the other players around you. But he still has to do um, multiple jobs well. Do you know what I mean? Not just scrum or or maul or whatever. There still has to be um, his roles have to still be good. Luke Thompson plays for Japan. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he's playing in the second row for Japan. Uh, like the, at the start of that uh, answer, he used the Japanese word to me. I was completely dumbfounded. I was like, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? A Japanese journalist came up to me afterwards and uh, he said to me that his translation was, is that right? So when I said to him that the, the tight head lock thing uh, is, is the kind of term at the moment, he said to me, is that right in Japanese? But I had no clue what he was talking about. So he's obviously made good inroads in terms of his uh, oh. Japanese already. So, uh, yeah, he's, uh, mostly, like, Rory Best started off his press conference with a bit of Japanese yesterday. He started off his welcome ceremony speech uh, last Friday in Japanese as well. Like, they were on it. They, they, we'll see more from uh, Andrew Porter as well later in the day. Uh, he's well on it when it comes to his food and all that. They have really immersed themselves in this. We saw on uh, Jacob Stockdale's Instagram account yesterday him going down to Shibuya Crossing. Uh, we saw a couple of them wandering around the hotel there earlier. They're, they're mingling around. They're getting around Tokyo. They're not going to be uh, prisoners in their hotel, that's for sure.
they've learned from Bordeaux, basically. Yeah. What, what are you, uh, have you any words learned for us on? Uh, I haven't really, to be quite honest with you. I, like, I know how to say uh, please, and I know how to say thank you, and I know how to say hello. And that's really all you need. And, and goodbye. I know, I know how to say goodbye as well. When I arrive out, I was hoping that you'd be my translator for me, but you've obviously no homework done. Buck up a little bit, will Absolutely. you? Absolutely no. I have done a little bit of homework. I, I can tell you that you, you might notice that it's not very noisy here. It's actually kind of like a little bit of a, a ghost town. It's because it is a national holiday today in Japan. It is Respect for the Aged Day. Uh, so if you've got uh, any uh, old people in Japan, anybody over the age of 65, it is their special day. It's incredible if you look at the statistics of old people in Japan. 28.4% of Japanese people are over the age of 65. That is the highest statistic in the world. I was chatting to somebody yesterday to see more wrestling about the Japanese economy, and they said that one of the reasons why it might have stagnated uh, over the last couple of centuries is that everybody's just too old here. The life expectancy uh, for women, I think, is uh, in the early 90s uh, at this point of babies born last year. Like it, It's got so old to the point where Japanese people who turned 100 used to get a silver sake dish. Now they only get a silver plated sake dish because they can't afford Jesus. so many silver plated <laughs> silver dishes away anymore. So that's the homework I've done, Alan. I have no Japanese for you, though. Okay, well, do a bit more work and, and be ready and later in the week for me. <laughs> what, have, what have you got for us this week, Alan? What's coming up? What's the schedule? So we got a, a couple of things on, on uh, Sunday. We had Ireland's Day in Motomachi, uh, a part. It's kind of like a shopping street uh, in Yokohama, one of the most... Uh, insane events I've ever been at. I was like, this is going to be a small thing. But actually, I, I was uh, the only Irish person there, but I was also the only Irish person, I was the only person there not wearing green. There was a lot of locals there who were absolutely obsessed with Ireland. There was a mass Kelly on the street. We'll bring you a report on that later in the week. And of course, uh, from the sumo yesterday, I also sat down uh, during the weekend with, I will, I'm going to say the only Irish person, I'm pretty confident of that, the only Irish person who's ever become a sumo wrestler. So we'll bring that into you, uh, to you during the week. We've got plenty of Irish press as well, and hopefully a few big names coming your way as well. Tonight, I'm hoping to go see Japan GEA train. So I'm on the, on the way there right after this. All right, we'll let you go, Owen. Oh, uh, the weather, one last thing. with The, um, the Welsh are apparently uh, applying baby oil to their rugby balls. Uh, <laughs> is it that muggy? Is it that slippy? Yeah, it's it's bad. It's like you, you you need a rain jacket here at the same time, but at the same time you got to take the top off. Like it's, it's that sort of thing. I feel like I'm in Marbella, but I feel like I'm in uh, a wet day in Salt Hill as well. So it's it's a it's a weird mix. Like Luke McGrath yesterday was saying that during their warm weather training, they were all wearing these sweat jackets and stuff like that because they knew that the humidity would become a thing. So they didn't go for the Warren Gatlin baby oil option. They just went for sweat jackets, and perhaps that's a more sensible option. All right, all oh, good stuff. Uh, enjoy Japanese GAA, and we'll uh, talk to you tomorrow. Take care. Oh, and she in there on the phone from uh, on the, the Skype machine from Japan. When are you heading out? Wednesday. Nice. <laughs> yeah. First class? No, not first class. <laughs> Just not business class. class. Yeah, yeah. Maybe business, yeah. <laughs> maybe. maybe. <laughs> the only way to go. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it now. Look, it's been an incredible build-up, a long, long time. It's been uh, a long time in the making, so we'll, we'll see how to get on. Leave your earphones on, because I've got one clip I want to talk to you about uh, the line-out calling, because that was obviously one of the other issues about whether or not uh, all of the responsibility is going to fall on James Ryan or Henderson or who actually is going to be responsible for it. Here's uh, Simon Easterby. In... We talk um, amongst uh, a number of us, the line-out leaders, that, that will discuss the, the menu for each week and, and how, that, um, you know, how we'll implement that in, in terms of the game plan. And you know, it's, it's a collaborative uh, chat about how we put that together and then somebody's got to go and lead that as in every part of the game there's someone leading certain areas of the game and, and line is no different uh, so yeah, it is a collaborative um, sort of mix of, of ideas uh, guys who have looked at the, the footage and, and have spent time um, sort of immersing themselves in that, that part of the game and, and having the confidence then to, to speak to me and the other guys in the group with, with their opinions and then we, we put together a plan according to what the, uh, what the, the line-out menu needs. Is it, is it that big a deal ultimately if, um, if it is Henderson who's calling it when they've done all that work in advance and it's kind of pre-programmed in some respects? Well, I think the system um, for most international teams now, because uh, noise in the stadiums and stuff, you can't actually make walk in and make these calls. They're kind of, you see a lot of them have a little huddle and they have a call and then they have a buzzword to change it. Uh, and that's the way it probably works for most teams. Um, I think Simon's talking about the collaborative effort, collaborative effort 
um, and the amount of people who have input, which is, that's very important, that people sit down, your line-out leaders then decide your, your kind of menu for, for each game, and, um, and you try and implement it. If it breaks down, you need a kind of a plan B, and you need other options as well. Every team needs probably three, four, five banker balls that you kind of go back to. You might win, them, win it in the lineup where you want to, mm. but you win it. Yeah. So we see a lot flat too, if it's not being marked. You know, if you're being marked at the middle and the tail, you want it off the top. Fly half wants the ball off the, the middle or the back, which is the best place to get the ball off the top and deliver it. Um, sometimes you just have to win it. But I think the concern is that, uh, and, and look, because the stuff in England happened, um, I think they'll be better for it because there'll be more responsibility, um, there'll be more of an onus from Simon Easterby that guys know the role inside out. So if James Ryan is calling the lineouts now that you need backup as well. So if he goes off, something happened to him, yeah. who steps in, is it a smooth transition? If your second lineout caller, something happened to him, who's the third person? You need three or four guys capable of actually stepping in. And you want that, and you talk about lineout leaders, Line-out leaders are really important in the heat of the battle because no matter whether you're Paul O'Connell or Victor Matfield or the best line-out callers ever, you still need a little bit of input if Anthony's beside me and he gives me, look, your man is marking me at the tail or I'm free or keep an eye on uh, such and such in the opposition, the lob ball over his head is on or, you know, and you just, it's, it's, and you trust that because it's calm and so you need a little bit of input. They have these huddles all the time, you know, it's uh, obviously the hooker as well, very important, but I just think that um, I hope they've this stuff clarified and yeah. really nailed down because it's such a vital area. Yeah, and good stuff, thanks very much. Thanks, sure. uh, we're going to take a quick break, we'll be back at the Sports News at Phil, it's uh, 20 minutes past nine this morning. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. The 2019 Boyle Sports World Grand Prix Darts is back at the City West Convention Centre Dublin from the 6th to the 12th of October. See 32 of the biggest darting stars on the planet, including world number one Michael Van Gerwen, former Grand Prix champion Daryl Gurney, plus fan favourite Peter Wright. Get your tickets now at Ticketmaster.ie and search darts. The 2019 Boyle Sports World Grand Prix Darts at City West. Game on. Rugby season is back and Lifestyle Sports is giving you the chance to win something very special. The ultimate rugby year for you and three mates. You could be headed to the Champions Cup final. The Pro 14 final. Interprovincial games of your choice. And get match day ready with kit bags full of jerseys. New season training gear. 400 euro in vouchers and more. Check out LifestyleSports.com. Lifestyle Sports Rugby on Insta. Or buy any jersey in store or online for a chance to win. Live rugby with Lifestyle Sports. OTB AM The problem is with Arsenal even though you have a Bamiyan, I think he will save them so many times this season because he will get goals from them in games where they probably don't deserve really need, don't deserve really have them and it, they're just frail they seem a bit frail at the back they seem like they they can give opportunities away Louise again silly could have given a pen away in the first half just threw his leg out did exactly the same in the second half and got caught and they gave a penalty just it, situations that are going to happen throughout the course of the season where you need those four at the back or three wherever it may be just to be solid and consistent and Arsenal I don't think have that consistency make up with what, they're, with what they have there so it's going to be tough for them but like what we're going forward Arsenal have such a good attacking chair Pepe there was glimpses of him today he looked going past players like Declan sometimes as we discussed before his final ball was lacking and his finishing was lacking but you know, he looks like he's got bundles of pace, bundles of energy, great trickery about him and can cause teams problem. Aubameyang is, is probably going to be up there for Golden Boot at the end of the season if he, if he stays fit and can continue on in the, in the vein that he is because he's just such a such a good option for them, such a good attacking track and guaranteed goals pretty much. Lacazette into that mix as well. They, they've got a lot of goals in their team and they've got a lot of creativity. It's just can they stop them going in their end. So we're, we're talking about two different teams that have very similar issues. Uh, mm. Arsenal who are looking for top four, Watford are looking to get out of bottom out of the bottom three but if Arsenal want to realistically stay in the top four and get Champions League they, they need to be defensively more solid Torreira though I think when he's in that mix does help out a lot yeah okay so that's um, uh, the two Stevens there doing the game for us uh, yesterday 
but uh, the big news, which you've buried the whole show, which you completely forgot about, is that Liverpool won the league at the weekend, right? What are we? Uh, 16th of September, title's done. done. Yeah. Five points dropped now from Man City. That is it. That's it. We know, no, that's it. They just need 99 points now and they'll be grand. Yeah. Were Liverpool not seven points clear last season? You know, it's different now, isn't it? Heels are coming off. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we talked about it on the, the preview show on Friday. I said, I think where Liverpool are going to run into trouble is that World Club Championship where they have to go off travel, plus injuries. Laporte being injured for City is a big deal, but it's not as big a deal as if Van Dijk was to get injured for... Uh, yeah, in fairness. Van Dijk is the, is the key again. They have, they have an injury now, and they're riding it out pretty well in Alisson. Yeah, just about, yeah. I, I, I was trying to work out would Alisson have saved Wilhelm's efforts. It was a pretty decent strike, mm. but... Um, yeah, they're, they're getting away with it at the moment. Adrian, obviously, nowhere near as good as Alisson. They reckon Alisson will be back after the next international break, right. which would be Old Trafford. So that'll be his first game back. And uh, Routine win these days, right? Uh, nil all draw, wasn't it, last season? I, I just uh, As bad as United have been, their home record is decent enough. But yeah, like it, it, was, it was something I didn't... I was obviously in Crow Park and was keeping an eye on the... The news got coming through. I was like, I was no, like, what? It's like 2 0. Then I saw Aguero scores before half time. Ah, yeah, they'll probably come back, win 4 5 2. Then I see it goes 3 1. I just thought, then it went up 3 2. But even in a draw away to Norwich, that's, that's a bad result. Yeah. It's an awful result. But to lose away to Norwich <laughs> is a shocker. <laughs> but it's, uh, it makes things interesting. And uh, it was a good weekend, obviously, for Liverpool. It was a good weekend for Chelsea and Man U as well. So it's Liverpool are away to Chelsea next weekend. Norwich played the first game of the season, didn't they? Yeah, they played against Liverpool. Liverpool. Yeah, and do you remember they were castigated for this whole thing. The, the Norwich manager said, "You know, we wanted to go out. And we won the second half." You know, and the people were saying, "Like they won the second half." I think Chris Sutton was saying, "You know, which I like Sutton, but he was yeah. saying like this this idea. They were beating five one, weren't they? Four one, four yeah. one. Yeah, and a, but they played this really open kind of crazy brand of football. Yeah. you know. And people said, "Yeah, they'll have to change that. They'll, they'll score." But you know what? Bournemouth did the same when they came up. They took a few hidings and people said to Eddie Howe, you're going to have to change it. They're still in the Premier League playing yeah, the way that absolutely. they... Absolutely. So brilliant. Norwich aren't going to change. No. And also as well, they were absolutely decimated with injuries, Norwich. Like, that was a real patch together back four that they had. Uh -huh. Against City at the weekend. Yeah. Oh, right. So we're, here we are talking about how City are missing Laporte. Tim Close would be one of Norwich's more important players at the back and he's pretty much done for the season. And they just patched this team together and... They took advantage. Like the, the third goal they conceded, City, the Otamendi gets caught in the ball, very similar to how Arsenal conceded away to Watford yesterday. Oh, yeah. Just this is the new rule where obviously you can play out from the back. You don't have to wait for the ball to go outside the penalty area. And actually, I know it's something Jurgen Klopp has looked at. He's tweaked how they press because they can now press a bit higher because they can wait. The ball doesn't have to come outside the box. So you can, you can press really that press. bit higher now. Mm. Adam Ida was on the bench as well. Yeah, so it's uh, incredible stuff. So many teams, though, being caught with this. Yeah. Like, there's an awful lot of teams being caught with this press. Like, yeah. you think the good old Jack Charlton days just put it down to far end and let's all get around the old yeah, knock on. It's a winning style now. <laughs> like, you know, you're kind of, it's amazing how all the sports eventually just kind of do the full circle. Yeah. Because the amount of teams who can't actually play it, like, they're just not good enough. Some players just aren't good enough. No. Or the press is so intense. Yeah. Psychologically, if you see a lot of players rushing at you, you panic. Yeah. No matter how good you are, you're still going to panic. But as I said, that new rule it just means you can press even higher and yeah. as soon as someone gets the ball out, you're on them. And that's and the worst happened. thing is, it's not actually the guy who, who gets pressed. The onus is on the guy who goes, even if you watch it, it gives you the ball. Yeah. You're like, don't give it to me now. Like a classic <laughs> example was Ceballos at Anfield where he panicked so much, he tried to play this ball across his own penalty area and it went to Manny. Now Manny didn't score from it. But Ceballos had been brilliant the week before against Burnley and here he was making a fairly basic error. But it was because he was pressured into it and he didn't know what to do. Yeah. So he just said, right, I'm going to just try and get rid of it but at the same time find a player because obviously Unai Emery's message to his players is we don't want to pump it long unless you're playing it to one of our players. And yeah. That's where they got caught out for the goal yesterday. But they're back four. Maitland-Niles, a midfielder. Kolasinac, not good enough. Socrates and David Luiz. It's an interesting back four. Wow. I said it before the start of the season. <laughs> Arsenal are going to be 
box office entertainment because they're tuning it up, they're cruising, and they've come away. But they haven't, like, they've dropped two points. Yeah, and it feels that way. Yeah, Everton as well. Still looking for their first away win. But uh, I suppose we'll start with the dubs. Uh, Dublin ladies made it a weekend to remember for Dublin supporters. 24 hours after Jim Gavin's men had completed the five in a row, Mick Bowen's side won a third All-Ireland title in a row. It was an absolutely horrible day at Crow Park yesterday, but more than 56,000 supporters turned up. That's a record for the ladies' final. And the dubs beat Galway by 2-3 to four points. The all-important goals for Dublin coming from Sinead Goldrick and Hannah O'Neill. Earlier on at Crow Park, Tipperary won the intermediate title, beating Meath by 2-16 to 114. Louth were crowned junior champions in the first game of the day. They saw off for Mana by 3-13 to 2-6. I know you've just talked to Owen there and I suppose the big news coming from the Irish rugby camp today is the news on Robbie Henshaw and the management are confident he can play a part in Japan despite suffering a hamstring injury in training on Saturday. Uh, he looks like he'll definitely miss the tournament opener against Scotland on Sunday. They wouldn't confirm it, but I think we can take that as a given. He'll have every chance to prove his fitness. He'll be assessed on a daily basis. Keith Earls didn't train fully with the squad today. Joey Carberry did, though, and is in line to make his return against the Scots this weekend after that ankle injury that he suffered against Italy in the warm-up games. As I mentioned there, Arsenal let the two-goal lead slip in their two-all draw away to Watford in the Premier League. Uh, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang scored twice in the first half, uh, but then Arsenal conceded two second-half goals. Tom Cleverley and Roberto Pereira equalised from the spot David Louise was the uh, guilty party conceded a penalty 10 minutes from time Everton lost 3-1 away to Bournemouth Callum Wilson scored twice Dominic Calvert-Lewin had equalised for the Toffees just one point after three away games for Marco Silva side tonight Aston Villa host West Ham also the last of the FAI Cup quarterfinals Crumlin United stand in the way of the Bohemians and Shamrock Rovers semi-finals Crumlin face Bowes at Richmond Park tonight with the winners set to have a home tie in the semi-finals against Shamrock Rovers Ellen Keane won bronze in the 100 metre breaststroke SB8 category at the World Para Swimming Championships in London with a season's best performance last night it was Ireland's second medal of the championships after Nicole Turner took bronze in the 50 metre butterfly on Saturday night and Europe are back in possession of the Solheim Cup a dramatic final day of singles action at Glen Eagles eight points apiece between Europe and USA going into the singles Suzanne Pedersen hold the winning put to give Europe a win by 14 and a half 13 and a half Europe won the last three matches to beat the USA and Pedersen was pretty much out of the game for the last two years because she took time away to have a baby. She was originally selected as a vice captain and then she was given a wild card. People thought this was crazy and there she was on the, the last hole, eight foot put to win it and she held her nerve and it was... Uh, that was the USA were going for three in a row and it looked fairly unlikely that Europe were going to do it but... Uh, she held her nerve kind of similar, maybe similar enough to Keimer in Medina, a little bit longer in length, but a, a great put. Um, got to talk about Tyson Fury at the weekend. The lineal world champion retains yeah. his lineal title. Yeah, just about though. So by the time I got home from Crow Park and I watched the highlights of the Dublin Kerry game back and then I contemplated staying up to watch it and I said, Do you know what, I'll watch it again because, you know, Otto Wallen, he's going to win this handy. Tyson Fury and then when I found out that this fight could have been stopped. We need a, a warning here for those of you of a squeamish nature to look at the photograph of Tyson Fury's eye. So we get to gash above his eye. Oh. Nice. Oh. I'm saying 50 stitches. Out jelly That's going to take a bit of plastic surgery as well, which could come back to haunt, to you haunt him in, in future fights. But it also means was that... Was it a clash of heads or was it a punch? No, it was a punch, which right. means if it had been stopped, Fury loses. Right. If the referee had deemed that he couldn't continue, it gets, fight on, uh, it gets stopped in a technicality. Here's a picture of the referee, though. Tony Weeks. Tony yeah. Weeks at the end of the fight. Yeah. That is blood on both arms all the way up to the elbow, and then it's like a... So how did he get away without a stoppage? don't know. I mean, what they do there is they bring in the doctor, he looks at it, and... You know, it's definitely a case of who it is. It's Tyson Fury that, you know, he's he's the lineal world champion. He's undefeated. It's going to take something pretty spectacular for them to stop it. Yeah. But they would have been well within their rights. 
you can imagine if that fight was further down the card and it was two other oh, fighters. Oh, yeah, get him out. It, it's, it's similar to how when he got up against Wilder in the 12th round, most referees would have counted that fight counted out. Counted 10 and counted it out. Yeah, but right. also Tyson Fury... <laughs> 11, 12, yeah. 13, come on. The referee Never that cares. night said, no, I could see by looking at him that he was going to get up. Yeah. Whereas uh, that night watching the fight, I was like, there's no way he's getting up from that. But that's uh, if you're Tyson Fury, you're given a little bit more leeway. And yeah, well, this, so well, this is surprising from uh, his, his, obviously his... Uh, his uh, man in the corner, Jorge Capatillo, I think he says. He says, that was probably the worst cut I've ever seen in my years of doing cuts. But I knew the capacity of Tyson. I knew his experience and his will to fight. So I knew I had to get it right, put my job on the line and get the work done so he could continue fighting, not get stopped. Yeah. And cuts men are such a valuable well, it's, part of... It saved him millions but He says, I'm surprised that the doctor didn't stop it. Yeah. You know, that would have been a massive hit back for, for Fury. Mm. Yeah. Because you think, you know, he has to go for the rematch then, which is probably another six months. And yeah, then it's, like, it's a waste I mean, of time. That, it's just like a bad that would have been block. A, like, that would have been a lot more of an upset than Ruiz beating Joshua. It would have been more embarrassing for him. But it does still put the Wilder rematch on hold because he can't fight for a while. That, that eye has to heal. Yeah, He's but he can fight next summer, right? So that, that, yeah. should, that should be the next summer. They were talking spring. Were they? Okay. But now you're going to have to put that back a few months. And I wonder now as well, if you're fighting Tyson Fury, if you're thinking, right, let's go after that eye. Yeah, right. Cut. We're going to have a uh, Stephen Cluxton special on OTB AM tomorrow morning. Um, it is one of the great GAA careers and there's uh, strong speculation that it might be coming to an end. So if it is or if it isn't, uh, either way, we're going to pay... Uh, testimony to the season that he's had. He, probably Footballer of the Year. Is there anybody else that could get that at this stage? Uh, Barred at final, which I felt a bit sorry for McCaffrey, obviously, with the hamstring. Like if McCaffrey plays and, and does what he usually does, he's in the mix too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think Howard is in the mix. I thought one man who needs to be... Fitzsimons was unbelievable again. Yeah. I thought he was just brilliant. There's a real cameo piece where he has O'Shea out on the sideline about 15 minutes into the start of the second half and O'Shea's jinking, jinking and Fitzsimons never loses him. He ends up kicking a really weak shot into Cluxton's hands. Yeah. But it was just a real thing of and O'Shea looked hard at it. It was like, no, nah, it's not going to happen. Yeah. He's been brilliant. But no, Cluxton, just, you know what? He probably should have won a number of other All-Stars and I think he has to get it this year. And it won't be one of those Ryan Giggs, he had a good season oh, no, at 40. No, it'll actually. be like, he was genuinely the most important footballer in the country this year. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. We're live tomorrow as always from 7.30. Stay tuned to OTB Sports Radio throughout the day and if uh, there is any breaking news coming from the Dublin camp, we'll bring it to you live here on uh, OTB Sports Radio. Offtheball.com forward slash radio is uh, one place to get us. The other place, the easiest place is the Go Loud app. Off the ball back on the radio tonight from 7 o'clock. There's also our YouTube channel as well where Nathan's brilliant interview with Michael Owen is there for you to consume right now. We're going to leave you with this. It's Michael Owen about where his feud with Alan Shearer started. It feels like it's going to go any minute. Now, I'll start, no problem. No problem at all. If I were you, I'd chuck me on the bench and just, if we need a goal, just throw me on with 15 minutes to go and I'll try to nick one. But I don't feel as if I'm fit, I'll let would you down. Would that have been a normal enough conversation that you would have had with managers down the years? Yeah, but normally you wouldn't even consider it. You know, you'd, the physio would say to the manager, listen, he's not fit. He's, mm. he, maybe next week, he's probably about five, six days away from fully training, so maybe next... And it, it would just... Why would you risk for one game when you could be out for another six weeks? So, you know, but as it was the last game of the season, it was a conversation to be had. Listen, what are we losing by throwing you on and you're pulling your groin again and, OK, we might have to bring you back off, but it's worth the risk and it absolutely was worth the risk and I was willing to risk myself but for some reason Alan took it or thought or after the game thought that it was uh, that I didn't really want to put my body at risk um, in that last game and that I was you know saving yourself for saving a, a yourself. new contract exactly else. which of course is it's ridiculous when you in my eyes sorry it's in my eyes it might not be in other people's but you know, as I say, I've had 25 muscle mm. injuries. I've never bottled a game in my life. I mean, I've listed the games that I've played and scored in and whatever. I'm certainly not going to bottle it against Aston Villa. I mean, it would have been unbelievable to have scored a goal to, to save the club and to be a hero and everything else. But as I say, I had a, a problem at the time and I didn't feel as if I should start. But I would have started if he had asked me. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The 20-